Here in Council Members, you are now live on YouTube and TV30 will count you in. 40 seconds. Okay, here we go in five, four, three, two, one, we are live. Uh, welcome everyone to this evening's uh, Monday, June 28, 2021 virtual regular meeting of the Livermore City Council at uh, 7 p.m. It's, uh, as I said, virtual. The meeting participation information uh, can be found at the end of the agenda. And as we go along, the city clerk will be uh, giving information as to how to participate in the various uh, pieces of this. Uh, at this point, I'd like to uh, call the meeting to order and can we have a roll call? Council member Bonanno. Here. Council member Carling. Here. Council member Kick. Here. Vice Mayor Monroe. Here. Mayor Warner. Here. Next up is the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Everybody can follow along uh, on uh, mute mode. But I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. So up next is item, uh, agenda item two, which is proclamations and presentations. And tonight we have uh, Commission Chair Dennis Swanson will present the Historic Preservation Commission annual update. Uh, go ahead, Dennis. Good evening, uh, Mayor Warner and members of the city council and city staff. My name is Dennis Swanson and I serve as chair of the Historic Preservation Commission. Uh, the commission is made up of five members that serve at the pleasure of the city council. We currently have one vacancy and I know the council works very hard on filling the vacancies of the various boards, but my appeal tonight will be to the general public that might be tuned in. And if you have any interest in preserving Livermore's uh, historic resources, I encourage you to uh, go to the city website and uh, look up uh, advisory bodies, uh, bodies and there's applications there if you have any interest. Uh, I wanted to update the City Council on the work of the Historic Preservation Commission uh, over the course of the last year. Much like all the other boards and commissions and the council itself, the HPC had transitioned into a digital format because of the pandemic. However, we continue to preserve Livermore's history and promote public awareness of Livermore's history. The HPC's core functions include identifying and designating new historic resources in the city and reviewing development applications to ensure existing historic resources are not negatively impacted or destroyed. The commission also approves historic plaques to be placed at historic sites throughout the city and encourages public awareness of the city's historic resources. Throughout the last year, the HPC has worked on a number of projects in support of our mission of preserving Livermore's history. For example, the commission provided advisory comments on the Isabel neighborhood specific plan to better preserve the history of Gandolfo Ranch. The commission also approved modifications to the Hageman Ranch, a site on the National Register of Historic Places to improve its appearance and maintain its uh, historic integrity. If you haven't had a chance to look at those improvements, I encourage, I encourage you to drive by the Hageman Ranch and you will notice them uh, upon entering the ranch. And probably the greatest uh, item that we worked on was recommending an updated policy framework for Livermore's historic preservation which included a new citywide historic context statement 
a new citywide historic resource inventory and revised historic uh, standards, all of which the council approved in April. And thank you for doing that. Finally, the commission uh, accepted the 2019 governments, uh, the governor's historic preservation award for the city's work in preserving the railroad depot and moving it to the Livermore Transit Center. Uh, as we move forward with the Eden uh, housing project, I hope that we are able to carve out uh, a piece of where the original uh, train depot existed and place a plaque, uh, perhaps a monument, or maybe even a, a photo gallery uh, displaying a, what the, the train depot looked like at that location. Over the next year, the HPC will continue to review development applications, designate historic properties, and approve uh, historic plaques in order to better preserve Livermore's history for future generations to come. Thank you very much for your time this evening. You're muted, Bob. Uh, thank you uh, very much for what you and your commission members uh, do. I really appreciate it. And we'll see about how we can get you uh, a full augmentation there. Be looking for it. And thanks for your ideas. Like uh, for instance, uh, mentioning the train depot and also the fact that the uh, you know, the transcontinental went through that area. Uh, and does anybody else, on, oh, I see uh, Councilmember Bonanno would like to say something. Yeah, hi, thank you, De thank you, Dennis, very much for that presentation. Um, just wanted to let you know that I was at a Quest event Saturday downtown uh, at Stockman's Park and I ran into Alan Frank, who I'm sure you know, he's our resident uh, railroad historian and he was already lobbying for lobbying me and others there for a uh, commemoration of the railroad, either the tracks or the depot or some kind of nice commemoration. So I think, I think there's a lot of uh, endorsement of that idea. So you, you certainly have a fan in Allen wanting to make that happen. And congratulations on that train depot award. Um, Historic Preservation Commission did an awesome job. I remember on the planning commission being part of uh, reviewing that project. It was just really great to see how that how beautifully that turned out and also just you know it was it, it i think it's turned out even better than than most of us imagined so congratulations on your role in that and, and thanks for the report thank you and uh you know thank you again and as we've opened up and uh, more people can circulate uh hopefully everybody can talk about the need for uh getting more members on the commission and uh hopefully people will be interested in that so thank you again and uh see you next year all right so the, uh, we're on to item, uh, agenda item three, Citizens Forum. It's just about 7.10. So I want to say we, for this segment, we'll have up to 30 minutes and with a stop time of uh, 7.40. And at any remaining comments past that, we'll pick up towards the end of the meeting. And at this point, could the uh, city clerk explain the process, please? Yes, thank you, Mayor. When participating in this portion of tonight's meeting, one comment may be given per person per item. Members of the public can participate by using the raise hand feature or star nine if calling in when the item begins. Please do not wait until the public comment period opens for each item to raise your hand. Instead, raise your hand as soon as the item is introduced. Once public comment opens, each participant's name will be announced and their three minutes will begin upon being unmuted. The mayor will announce the conclusion of the public comment period after comments have been voiced into the record. Okay, uh, thank you. At this point, uh, how many hands do we have raised? Mayor, currently we have six. Okay, great. Okay, can we uh, begin? Yes, Mayor, the first public comment is listed as a phone number, um, followed by John Marchon and Mark Triska. I will unmute the phone number that is dialing in. Oh yes, if that person could identify themselves, that'd be great. Hello, this is Alan. Hello, this is Alan Marling, Livermore resident. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, as we burn in the climate crisis, California Public Utilities Commission acted with urgency to protect oily utility companies' profits. Last week, the corrupt commission voted to throttle rooftop solar energy, making it a luxury item. 
I ask Livermore City Council to pass a resolution condemning the proposed changes to their net energy metering policy and speaking in favor of rooftop solar, such as the res this could be similar to the resolution passed recently by the city of Santa Cruz. So again, uh, thank you, Alan Marling, Livermore resident. Next speaker is John Marchand, followed by Mark Triska and Megan Ghost. Mark, uh, John Marchand, please unmute yourself. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, uh, Mayor Werner and members of the council, uh, the members of the group of many names, Friends of Livermore, Save Livermore Downtown, Vibrant Livermore, the community group, Citizens for Central Park and all of the others, have proven that they will do anything, say anything, and pay anything in their efforts to kill the approved downtown plan that was created with input from thousands of Livermore residents. This group published an expensive ad in the Independent that claimed that the Eden site contained radioactive contamination. That is a lie. The regional board, Regional Water Quality Control Board, has already approved the city's cleanup plan. On the preserved downtown Livermore website, they say that there is no Veterans Park. That is a lie. In their oft-touted poll claiming four to one opposition to the plan, Save Livermore Downtown told people that the park was 40% smaller. That is a lie. The park is actually 30% larger. Livermore voters were told by the group of many names that Measure P was about a larger park. That's a lie. In the 58 pages of the referendum, the word park was never mentioned. The local Sierra Club recently passed a resolution claiming that the Eden site is so contaminated that parking for apartments should not be built. At the same time, they are trying to convince us that the site should instead be used as a park for children. In Measure P, the members of the group of many, name, many names spent over half a million dollars trying to convince voters that they really wanted a hotel on Railroad and L Street. That was a lie. The truth is over 80% of the public input agreed the hotel should face Livermore Avenue. In his recent letter to the editor, Jim Hutchins from Preserve Downtown Livermore writes that Livermore citizens should be wary of big money. That is true. Beware of big money. Ms. Cyrus Sweet III of New Hampshire, the vice chairman of the Intermatic Corporation, gave $107,000 to the No on P misinformation campaign. Jane Woodward of Palo Alto gave over $100,000. Lynn Seppelik contributed $465,000, and Jean King gave over $184,000. Joan Seppelik contributed over $98,000. They avoided state campaign finance laws by creating multiple committees and making the maximum contributions to each. Five people spent over almost a million dollars trying to buy a Livermore election. Why? To put a hotel with no parking on L Street. So far this year, hundreds of thousands of dollars have been spent against Eden housing by a small handful of wealthy elite in an effort to keep people that they deem unworthy out of Livermore. Logic and reason do not support their bigotry. That is why the lies, the big money from out of town lawyers, PR firms and contributors. Thank you. The next speaker is Mark Triska followed by Megan Ghost and Donna Cavane. Mark Triska, please unmute yourself. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor Werner and City Council members. Uh, this is Mark Triska. I've been a 36-year resident in the Livermore area and have been a commercial real estate broker for the past 32 years. I specialize in Tri-Valley commercial real estate and specifically in the Livermore downtown area. I am currently Executive Vice President at Colliers International. And the reason why I'm speaking tonight in the Citizens Forum is that recently, two of my local fellow realtors have publicly stated that the highest and best use of the Eden housing site is as a public park. And this just doesn't sit well with me. In fact, in reality, it's the opposite. Land values are based on the rate of return to the owner or investor. Currently, the highest value 
the highest and best use and therefore the highest value in order is first, residential, secondly, industrial, third, retail, and finally, office. A park, in fact, it provides a negative return. It absolutely is the lowest value. In fact, it is a negative value. A park requires a cost to maintain it, to manage it, to insure it, to police it. In fact, it doesn't provide any income whatsoever to the owners or to the citizens of Livermore. Eden Housing, on the other hand, on the other hand, will have residents that will pay rent. And while there are subsidies to develop this, this project, tenants will pay a fair rent and will provide an income and return to the investors. So again, I'm just going on record to state that when a realtor, when you hear a realtor say that the highest and best use for the two plus acres of land in downtown Livermore is a public park, there's absolutely no basis in this. And I'm happy to answer any questions that the council has regarding this. Thank you. The next speaker is Megan Ghost, followed by Donna Cabane and Jackie Coda. Megan, or Michigan Ghost, please unmute yourself. Uh, hello, can you hear? Hello? Yes, we can. Uh, hi, I'm Roger Logan. My remarks are for item 6.2, the draft climate action plan. Uh, could you, uh, if uh, you, you, this uh, citizens forum is for items not on the agenda. So if you could hold your comments for item 6.2, that would be good. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, thanks. Okay. The next speaker is Donna Cavane, followed by Jackie Coda. Donna Cavane, please unmute yourself. Good evening. I respectfully ask that you hold a hearing about contamination in the soil and groundwater in the downtown area. The Water Board and Ms. Craig, the city consultant, stated that a hearing will be held if residents request it. This is a very complex issue. I there and a hearing, a complete hearing is needed. I am therefore requesting a complete hearing. And I need to correct some false statements um, that were made by Mr. Marchand just a few minutes ago. The Sierra Club did pass a resolution. I serve on the Sierra Club as an executive committee member. We never mentioned parking or a park in our resolution. Our resolution simply requested that all materials about contamination be posted on the website and that the city hold a hearing. Again, the Sierra Club resolution never mentioned anything about parking or a park. Thank you for your time. Next speaker is Jackie Coda, followed by Diatra Gianni. Jackie Coda, please unmute yourself. Thank you. Something nefarious is going on within our cities, our school boards, and our counties. What we've noticed is that there's a Marxist revolution that's going on within our bureaucrats, and we're tired of it. Mayor Marchand, former Mayor Marchand, indicates that People were lying about different information that he says with regard to contamination in the housing area. However, he also is lying himself. When the community got together, actually the community got together, we specifically stated that in that area, if there was housing, we wanted it to be luxury housing with retail on the bottom so that the people who live there could actually frequent the businesses and the restaurants downtown. Mayor Marchand and the city council at that time utilized affordable housing dollars to purchase the property. Why did they do that? When we had our meeting a few weeks ago, every single community member with the, with the exception of about three spoke up and said that they did not agree with the housing. 
They did not want the housing there because guess what? We've got housing across the street now and the old Growth Brothers parking lot area. So it is unnecessary for us to have housing downtown. We have a better use. We had a very large rally down there this weekend on Saturday. It would have been nice to have a larger park or larger area of space for people to sit under trees and enjoy themselves while they're frequenting the restaurants and the businesses downtown. But the park that they have created is very small. So it's really not enough for people to utilize while they're enjoying the downtown. A low income housing project would be an extreme eyesore. The schemes that we've seen don't give the people any residents, any of the residents outdoor um, ability, balconies or anything within the residence. And it looks like a prison. But you know what? I'm not surprised. After seeing a photograph of Mayor Marchand with Fang Fang, the Chinese communist spy, we're not surprised what his ulterior motives are because it seems like it's par for the course for this council. You don't listen to the people. Everything you do is against the people. You're constantly trying to penalize the people and make it difficult for people to do business in this city. Not only that, you lied to the people and you didn't support any businesses the entire year during COVID. COVID has not been isolated under a microscope in a, in a laboratory, but you people never asked any questions. We're tired of our, our bureaucrats lying to us. We're tired of you lying about the vaccine. There is no vaccine. It's an experimental injection. A vaccine is a product that simulates a person's immune system to produce immunity. This experimental injection does not do that. So we don't trust you anymore. We have no faith in you. And we respectfully ask that you all resign because you don't represent us at all. Thank you. The last speaker is Diatra Gianni. Diatra, please unmute yourself. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I live at North Dale Street, 391 North Dale Street. And I, I have, um, I'm trying to follow this. I'm getting the feedback. I'm trying very hard to do this right. Um, I'm very unhappy with the uh, development up on the corner where I have unfinished development. It's really a mess. And um, I'm sorry to see that it isn't finished. I'm afraid this may happen again at the Eden Project. You may find contamination later uh, when the underground parking is developed and have a huge problem in the future. We should be learning a lesson from Seaside, Florida, where poor building construction has caused a huge problem which is all over the news right now. I would like you to take that. I would like to see you take that risk in a situation I realize could be very similar. I oftentimes wonder what the city council has, it, what's in it for you to build uh, and want to have all this housing, even, even development in this area. I'm not against um, development. I think people should have a place to live. I'm a re real, I have um, income property and my family does as well here in town. We provide good housing for other people and we're proud to do it. But I think this area is unsuitable for uh, the needs of the community as a whole. I just kind of wonder what's in it for you. And that we should study the contamination situation very seriously, or we will end up with a big mess, similar but not the same as the uh, Surfside uh, community in Florida and other communities and other countries as well. Thank you for listening, and I hope you make the right decision for all of us tonight. Mayor, that concludes public comments. Okay. Um, thank you. We're on to uh, a close public uh, comment period at this point. We're on to the consent calendar. <clears throat> and the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, consent calendar items are considered routine and are acted upon the city council with a single action. Uh, members of the audience wishing to provide public in input must use the raise hand feature. And it's, uh, you, we just went through on how to participate. So is there uh, this is the full consent calendar. You can pick any one or any items you wish to speak to. Uh, and I think we had um, one earlier that wanted to talk to an item. So uh, I'll open public comment on the, uh, no, I guess it wasn't the consent calendar, sorry. Uh, anyway, it was 6.2. So is there anybody in the public who wishes to speak on the consent calendar? Yes, Mayor, there are three members of the public that would like to speak. The first is Donna Cabane. 
followed by Carol Silva and Jean King. Donna Cabain, please unmute yourself. We need a complete hearing, not a calendar consent item, to answer critical questions about contamination under the Eden Housing site. Staff is asking for $245,000 just for testing. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Cleanup activities would require a separate contract. Cleanup would involve the installation and monitoring of, of extraction wells, blowers, and possible soil excavation. What is the estimate for total cleanup costs, including monitoring for several years? A million? More than a million? Staff report states funding will come from capital improvement funds. But who funds capital improvement? Does this come from the general fund? If so, this means current residents, not Eden, are going to be paying for this. Current residents may want their tax dollars spent on other projects. We need a complete breakdown of funding sources and amounts. Staff report states that low income housing fund will finance part of cleanup costs. Instead of cleaning up contamination, should these funds be used to buy units for low income families? How many units would $245,000 buy? How many units would a million dollars buy? Cleanup consists of blowing treated contamination into the air and into the parking garage when completed. Projected cleanup is two years, but could continue beyond occupancy. This means residents will inhabit apartments while cleanup is ongoing. What is a realistic time estimate for low threat closure? Is the criteria for low threat closure only 50% removal of contaminants? If so, residents would be living over contamination for years. Staff report states, 1,800 tons of soil contaminated with volatile organic compounds were removed for Stockman's Park. Which landfill was used for disposable? At what price per ton? Do soils with VOCs have to be disposed of in a class one landfill? If you move the housing, there is no need to spend $245,000. Isn't the safest and cheapest solution to move Eden Housing off this site? Hold a hearing and give the residents a chance to voice their concerns and opinions after you post all relevant documents on the website, including correspondence with the Water Board. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Carol Silva, followed by Jean King and K Jackie Coda. Carol Silva, please unmute yourself. Hi, I'm Carol Silva. I was born and raised in Livermore. I have a lot of concerns in regards to the contamination. So basically I'm addressing 4.7 on the consent calendar. Um, I feel like that the current city council and the former Livermore mayor do not respect the public when the public comments are different than the council's uh, viewpoint. And it gets really discouraging. We have two national labs within our city and there's experts there involved that uh, are knowledgeable about hazardous materials. And if we had hearings and complete information and reports, I imagine that some of those individuals who work at the national laboratories would like to chime in because some of these contaminants are cancer causing contaminants. Uh, John Marche um, spoke about radioactive materials and I have no idea where he got that information, but um, the contaminants that are at that site, probably a large portion of them have either come from the train depot or quality uh, dry cleaners that were there. They're really bad contaminants. I'm not an expert, but I wouldn't really wanna live there. And 
I would have concerns about how the contaminants are going to be addressed and removed from the site. So um, I really think a lot more informa information needs to be provided to the public so that the public can provide uh, good input. And I really hope that the council would not uh, report and provide lies like there have been during campaigns. So thank you very much. The next speaker is Jean King, followed by Jackie Coda. Uh, Jean King, please unmute yourself. Good evening, Council. I would like to make a comment on item 4.7 for the um, item that talks about spending some more money to study the Eden site in downtown Livermore. Uh, again, as Donna said, you're spending $257,000 just to study and to make a report on what has to be done. So it implies very much that it's gonna be very expensive to study it and then to remove the contaminated items. Save Livermore downtown did have an ad. They did have a sign that said hazardous waste. It did not imply that it was radioactive waste. That sign and saying hazardous waste does say that it does have hazardous waste there. The arsenic and the lead are listed as being hazardous wastes. So it was not an incorrect statement. I asked the council to have a public forum to inform the citizens about the site. We do need to have clear information about what is on the site and what is hazardous and what will be the cleanup to do it, which will include all the different chemicals that are there and how much it's going to cost. These are very expensive things. And if you're going to dig up to have an underground garage, you're going to be disturbing the soil and moving it around, which creates some of the problems. Whereas if it were left alone, it would not be as hazardous, but you're going to stir it up and make vapors, I understand, and do it. But it's very important to have the experts come and explain these things to the public. It, it, if it is going to be expensive, we need to know where is the money going to come from. I presume since the city owns it, the city will have to clean it up. Will the money come from the, um, the general funds to do this from the taxpayers? Will it, the money come to clean it up come from the low income fund that will reduce the amount that been, can be spent on actually building new lower income houses? So please have a public forum to say that, say where the money is going to come from, what's going to be done, and how long it's going to take. So I thank you very much. The next speaker is Jackie Coda, followed by... Alan, Jackie Coda, please unmute yourself. I'm commenting on item 422. The reason I'm back again tonight to comment about this is because the city continues to lie and extend a continued local emergency when there is no local emergency. We are tired of your lies and your propaganda with regard to the COVID-19 virus. California Health and Safety Code 101080 in, it incumbents you to absolutely remove a local emergency at the earliest convenience. It has been over a year and a half that we've been dealing with this. There is no emergency. The CDC had to reduce their numbers by 1600% with regard to the deaths because there's fraud. The County of Alameda had to reduce their numbers by 25% because of fraud. There's fraud all around. Why is it that you people keep pushing the propaganda? Is it because you're waiting for the next variant, the Delta variant, the propaganda, and the fear campaign to come along so that you can lock people down again, destroy businesses and mask people up? It's quite concerning that we have a council that doesn't do their research. It's 
very concerning that you continue to extend this local quote unquote emergency when there is no emergency. Herd immunity has been absolutely attained. The virus is actually a 99.9% .9 recovery rate if you actually get it. And there is no emergency. I highly advise you and suggest that you terminate the local emergency. Is it just because you've gotten comfortable for receiving the money from the state? Because that's fraud, if that's the reason why you continue to extend the local emergency when there is no emergency. See, you have to understand, you people think we're stupid, but we're not. We do our research. Yeah, we know that you guys are totally focused on fake news and propaganda and the, the counts of the deaths that the New World Order keeps uh, continually propagating on the public. But guess what? We do our research and we know you're lying. So I highly suggest that you terminate the local emergency because you look like fools, you are fools, and we're tired of your lies to us. Across the board, this council has been lying. It started with Mayor Marchand last year, and it continues with you. You have no credibility, and we respectfully request that you terminate the local emergency because it is fraud, and California Health and Safety Code 101080 specifically requires you to terminate it with at the earliest convenience. It's been a year and a half. There is no emergency. It's time to move on. Next speaker is Alan, followed by John Collins. Alan, please unmute yourself. Hello. Hello, this is Alan Marlin, the Vivian Residence. First of all, in response to the previous commenter, COVID is a real disease and anyone telling you different is trying to get you to be a member of their death cult. Now, regarding the consent cal calendar and the money proposed to clean up the Eden housing site, go ahead and spend that money. If only we could remove the toxic lies spread by Joan Sepala in the independent so cheaply. I call for a public forum on the poisonous effect of the money she and other elites pump into the Brenda Livemore and other groups in an attempt to control the city. Thank you. Next speaker is John Collins. John, please unmute yourself. And John Collins, please unmute yourself. Okay, sorry. Yes, this is John Collins. I'd like to talk about the climate action plan. I think it's item number six. Uh, am I too soon or Am I, can I talk about this now? Too soon. We're on the consent calendar. We're in items four. You're talking okay, about sorry. So do I have to wait till to raise my hand when, when we're on that? Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Um, Mayor, there are no other comments. Okay, with that, I'll close the uh, public comment on the uh, consent calendar. And I see uh, Council Member uh, Kick has your, you have your hand raised. You want to uh, say something on the consent calendar? I take it. Yeah, I I just um, uh, it seems that people might be a little confused, and I understand this is this is new to a lot of people. So when you're looking at the agenda, if you go to the staff report, you can go all the way down to the bottom, and it says something fiscal and administrative impacts. It'll tell you exactly where the money's come from. Um, so if you're confused on any item where we're spending money on, it'll tell you exactly where this money is coming from. Um, and our um, finance department always does a great job of telling you where that money comes from. So you can take a look at that. Um, and then I, I just wanted to clarify um, that there's nothing on this agenda. We're done voting on on any approvals for, for Eden Housing. Is that correct, Mark? I just... It seems that people might be unclear. Honorable council member, this is Mark Roberts, your city manager. Um, yes, your the council has taken a final action on the Eden housing project. Okay, thank you. And okay. I'll just move that we uh, approve the consent calendar. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, now, now that that's been moved, we'll need a second. And then uh, we still have uh, options for discussion. 
So it's uh, best to wait and see if there's any other discussion before you move. Okay. Anyway, uh, well, do I have a second for moving the consent calendar? Sure, I'll second. Okay, good. Now, is there any discussion on the consent calendar? Yes, I'd like to pull an item for a brief discussion. Item four. Sure. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to understand a little bit more about that. I think, um, as I understand it, this is 4.8, which is professional services for the storm water asset, storm water asset condition assessment project. I think this is related to um, perhaps the first step in an important work program that we gave one of our highest priorities to in our goals and priorities setting uh, exercise uh, several months ago. So I was just hoping maybe we could just talk a little bit about what this item entails and how it sort of uh, spring loads the rest of the work we intend to accomplish on, again, what we've uh, assigned one of our top five priorities in the city for the coming two years. So I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about it or have a little, little discussion about it from staff, please. Council Member Bonanno, Mark Roberts, your city manager. Um, item 4.8 uh, includes an agreement um, with a consultant team um, to provide more detailed analysis of um, our existing stormwater system. This takes the data that we have uh, gathered as a part of our preliminary analysis of all of our asset classes and provides more detail on uh, our stormwater system. Um, as you noted, the council identified uh, the stormwater system um, in particular among our asset classes as one that uh, was appropriate for additional study and analysis. Um, and uh, was a uh, prerequisite for moving forward with further steps here. Um, this baseline information um, will then be uh, part of uh, developing our overall um, uh, approach for our asset management class dealing with um, storm water in particular. So thank you for that. So this really, the assessment that we're gonna get as a result of this work, this particular piece of the work package is really gonna to start to develop um, sort of the roadmap for how we move forward with the rest of this activity, which again is, is quite important to us. And I, I just think it's important to recognize that this really kicks off a, a quite an important activity. And I think that um, what we said was what we learned here is gonna guide the rest of the effort or be yes, part of what the rest of the effort. Yeah, detailed information at this level um, is important to guide the rest of the activities. As you know, um, we have a lot of analysis left to do on stormwater. This takes us from a, a very cursory review of that asset to a more detailed review of that asset. Okay, thank, thank you very much for that um, background and, and a little bit more about what we're, what we're signing up for here tonight. So that, that's all I have, thank you. Anyone else have a comment on the consent calendar? I don't see any, I have one on uh, four seven. I, I must uh, confess, a little confused by the public comment. The same speaker seemed to simultaneously be arguing that they wanted facts, but they don't want us to pay for facts to get them so we can have a conversation. So a little strange in my mind. Uh, I'm a scientist. And so I believe having facts is useful and you don't get facts without doing a study. Uh, so I'm in favor of 4.7. The other thing I would point out, uh, let's not be uh, deluded in thinking this, this is the only site downtown that has uh, contamination. It's been a heavy industrial site all over the place. And uh, one speaker referenced a dry cleaner. Well, there are lots of dry cleaners, even on the target area they're uh, looking at. So uh, I would just say, let's get real here. We need to get facts. We need to pay for them. And then we're going to have a conversation and we'll be working very closely with the water board who with that's the agency that governs what we do. So I, I would just suggest everybody power down and let us get some rational information for a good conversation rather than just political rhetoric. So with that, can we have a, uh, a roll call vote please? Councilmember Bonanno? Aye. Councilmember Carling? Aye. Councilmember Kick? Aye. Vice Mayor Monroe? Aye. Mayor Warner? Aye. The passes, consent calendar passes unanimously. We're on to item five.
Let me scroll down here. And okay, we're on to um, public hearings. And this is uh, regarding the master fee schedule. And could we have the uh, staff report at this point, please? Honorable Mayor, Mark Roberts, your city manager. I'd like to introduce uh, Douglas Alessio, our administrative services director. We'll be giving the presentation on this item this evening. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and members of the council. This is Doug Alessio, your administrative service director. Uh, item 5.1 is uh, the master fee schedule. The master fee schedule reflects fees charged by all city departments for certain services provided. The fees charged by the city are intended to recover the actual cost of providing services, which includes direct labor costs, overhead costs, and the costs of materials and supplies. The intent of the master fee schedules is set forth in a single document, the fees for all city related services and activities, such as zoning and building permits, application fees, inspection fees, fees for services provided by our enterprise funds and utility rates. These charges are approved by city council and are regulated by state and federal agencies. Is the industry best practice? Review and update the master fee schedule annually, allowing for easy access to fees for services and charges, providing a better understanding to the public of all fees charged by the city of Livermore. The schedule uh, does not cover property and development related fees, such as development impact fees or infrastructure. Updating and amending master fee schedule annually allows for a centralized location to guide city staff and the public and quickly locating the appropriate fees and for services. And uh, it allows fees to be added, revised or deleted in conjunction with the annual budget development process. The fee schedule before you, um, it basically um, is a listing of the fees already in existence. Um, there's a CPI of 1.6% uh, applied to the previous year's fees, unless otherwise noted in the fee schedule. And there are four changes to the fee schedule that you highlight in the staff report. Uh, we are uh, adding two items, a uh, certificate of compliance from the engineering department, an encroachment in telecom, inspection fees based on project valuation. We're also deleting an item, uh, encroachment permit based project fees. And uh, the last item is we are deleting a fire inspection discount. So the way that we provide fire inspection services has changed in the past two years. Uh, the city used to bill every business uh, prior to receiving an inspection annually. And if you paid your inspection fee um, within um, close uh, time frame of receiving the bill, we, we give you a discount. Uh, we discontinued the practice and only now bill uh, after an inspection has been provided. And so um, offering a discount um, for something uh, that uh, you were paying well before the service was provided seemed to make sense. And now that uh, we're only doing it in arrears after you've received an inspection, um, we don't offer discounts anywhere else. So we're recommending that that uh, discount be repealed. And that's the end of my presentation for this evening. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Okay, uh, before we do that, uh, is there any member of the public that wishes to comment on this item? Mayor, no comments have been received. Okay, I'll open and close the uh, public comment on this item and I'll bring it back to the council. Any uh, questions or comments? How about a motion? I would move a, move a approval of item 5.0. I'll second. 5.1, excuse me. I'll second that too. Okay, moved and seconded. Can we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Banana? Aye. Councilmember Carling? Aye. Councilmember Cake? Aye. Vice Mayor Monroe? Aye. Mayor Warner? Aye. So it passes unanimously. We're now on to 6.1, uh, the uh, oral report from our Director of Emergency uh, Services regarding COVID-19.
Good evening, Honorable Mayor. Um, give me just a moment. Let me uh, share my screen here. All right, since the last time you had a report from your Director of Emergency Services, uh, we've had a number of changes. The most notable, of course, was that California's Blueprint for a Safer Economy um, and the County of Alameda lifted uh, their shelter in place orders. Um, as you note from statewide uh, regulations, uh, fully vaccinated uh, people can go unmasked now in many settings. Alameda County no longer requires capacity limits at businesses throughout the county, um, but businesses themselves may require masking or capacity limits on their own. The Alameda County local emergency declaration remains in effect um, and the need uh, for emergency response from the county continues for the time being. Our local declaration of emergency for the city of Livermore also remains in effect. Um, uh, several of the regulations that we've put in place to support uh, activities during the emergency remain in place. Uh, one of them is the eviction uh, moratorium um, that uh, is based on the state eviction moratorium, but also has uh, local requirements as well. And the second is the expansions uh, granted to various businesses throughout the community um, to provide activities, business activities outside of their buildings or to waive parking requirements. Um, those regulations depend on our uh, local emergency uh, declaration um, to be able to waive those regulations. Normally, a business would be required to provide full parking for all of its uses on, on private property or would not be permitted to use public property for those uh, private business uses. So for that reason, we are continuing to maintain our emergency declaration, um, but we do anticipate that sunsetting later this year. At this point, the eviction moratorium is scheduled to expire at the state level uh, at the end of September. We would expect to follow suit at that time as well. And of course, um, as uh, the weather changes uh, late in the year, we would expect uh, that we will be ending the special regulations uh, later in the year um, that have allowed us to expand those outdoor activities um, since those activities now are permitted to return back indoors. So we still have uh, between 90 and 120 days uh, left at this estimate, um, but uh, that is our current estimate of uh, where we are in the emergency. Of course, uh, on the 15th of June, uh, we welcomed uh, customers, customers back to all of our city facilities. So all of our city facilities now uh, are open their normal business hours. There's some limited exceptions. Um, our Civic Center Library is not currently open on Sunday um, and our Springtown Library has limited hours. Um, but beyond that, uh, the rest of our facilities are back to their normal hours. And of course, Cal OSHA issued revised workplace regulations governing masking and social distancing in the workplace. Um, and overall, those new rules significantly relax uh, any uh, previous restrictions um, related to vaccinated employees. You can see our seven day rolling average of new COVID cases, um, both in the county and in the city of Livermore. The Livermore is the more orange line and Alameda County is the blue line. You'll see both of those um, during the past couple of weeks have ticked up just a little bit. And of course that's to be expected. Um, we had a major uh, relaxation of all of the regulations um, to keep uh, people socially distanced or mask. So we would expect at this point with the vaccination rates we do have in the county, a little bit of an uptick um, and that's what we've seen. But the good news is that does appear to be a very small uh, uptick at this point. So very good news on that particular front. You can see our cumulative cases there um, and our seven day rolling average. The 7.89 number is up just a little bit um, from two weeks ago, but again, still um, below three. Vaccination data, um, this is taken directly from the county website, um, and we have uh, updated our city website to include this information just this afternoon. So now we will have a snapshot of the uh, county uh, vaccination data on our city website if people do want to see um, how many folks uh, in the county and what percentage of folks are vaccinated both countywide in cities throughout Alameda County and in Livermore. You can see there that 73.7% uh, of our residents have at least one dose and 62.1% are fully vaccinated. You can see over time the trend line between Alameda County and the city of Livermore. You see we trail just a little bit. You see that drop in the middle 
um, was related to, since this is a percentage graph, it's when the base got a little bit bigger when we added um, residents who were 12 uh, and older to the eligibility requirements of who could get a vaccination. And you can see we um, still trail the county just a little bit on the overall percentage of folks um, who are fully vaccinated. We continue our vaccine outreach with information on our website, social media, posters and signage in the farmer's market um, to continue to get the word out. Stanford Valley Care has begun their homebound vaccination program and continues to implement that uh, for individuals uh, who are unable to leave their homes and is coordinating directly with our Meals on Wheels senior support Tri-Valley providers. Um, and you can see some contact information there on the screen. Um, and staff continues to coordinate with the county and uh, Stanford uh, Healthcare, Valley Care, to locate additional mobile vaccine clinics in Livermore. And we're reaching out, of course, to our faith-based organizations to provide up-to-date information to share with their communities if they wish. So we have local vaccine clinics, both at Stanford Valley Care uh, and uh, at Access Community Health, uh, provided at the Civic Center Library. You can see at uh, Stanford Healthcare Valley Care um, that they uh, have uh, operational availability on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays from 9.30 to 2.15. And of course, uh, if a child 12 to 17 um, wants to uh, be vaccinated, Stanford's Children Health will be uh, providing that uh, vaccination. Um, and they do need to have a parent or guardian uh, accompany them during the process. Access Community Health is uh, offering vaccinations at the Civic Center Library on Tuesdays and Thursdays, 10 to 4.30. And uh, again, that's available to anybody 12 years and older. There is no charge for uh, the vaccine. No insurance is needed and walk-ins uh, are welcome at both of these sites. Wanted to give you a quick update on the uh, nearly $2 million of support that have been distributed out into the community through a variety of uh, programs to help local businesses and local residents um, through the COVID crisis. Um, you can see the uh, overall uh, spending on this is each of these programs um, are essentially wrapping up at this point. Um, and of course that was on purpose. The purpose of these programs were to help businesses and residents um, while the impacts of COVID um, limited operations um, or had a shelter in place uh, regulation. Um, and you can see uh, essentially that uh, almost all of those dollars are expended at this point. And with that, I'm available for any questions. I, I think at this point, I'll uh, open it up for a public comment before we turn it back to the council. Anybody wish to speak on this item? Yes, Mayor, there's one member of the public. Uh, Jackie Coda, please unmute yourself. Once again, here we are. We're talking about the numbers and the numbers show that we are not in a health emergency. You are required by Health and Safety Code 101080 to remove the local emergency at the earliest convenience. However, you keep pushing the propaganda and we're tired of it. We don't believe you anymore. You guys have lost all credibility and so has the county. You're violating laws left and right. Regulations and guidelines are not laws. You're violating the laws. Carrie Mullis, who won the 1993 Nobel Prize for inventing the PCR test, said that Dr. Anthony Fauci lacks knowledge of medicine and is willing to lie on television. Mullis also admitted in another set of videotape remarks that the PCR test does not tell you you're sick. So why is it that you guys are so focused on the PCR test? Is it because you're just programmed by propaganda? It's ridiculous. Dr. Robert Malone, the inventor of the mRNA vaccine, said that he has concerns about why this is the wrong technology to use for COVID-19, and in particular, the extreme danger it poses to young people. You guys are continually calling it a vaccine and it's not a vaccine. It's a product, vaccine is a product that stimulates, like I said, a person's immune system to produce immunity. This so-called COVID-19 vaccine does not provide the individuals who receive the vaccine with immunity to COVID-19. In fact, the fact sheets even state that, nor does it prevent the transmission of the disease, it does not meet the CDC's own definition of vaccine. That's why it is deceptive trade practice under 
15 U.S. Code Section 41 of the Federal Trade Commission for pharmaceutical companies who are producing this experimental gene therapy to claim that it's a vaccine. So why do you guys continue to push the propaganda? I wonder. It seems very nefarious. It seems like there is an alternative motive. Maybe money. Yeah, that's what I think it is. It's money. Because you guys refuse to do the research. You say you're a scientist. Well, why? Haven't you asked the question, why hasn't COVID been isolated in a laboratory under a microscope? You've never asked that question, have you? So you so-called scientists are have lost all credibility. You're not a scientist. You're just a game show host. And we're sick and tired of it. You, know, you swore an oath to uphold our constitutional rights and you're not doing it. You're lying to us every two weeks and we're sick of it. It's time for you to terminate this local emergency and let us get back to our lives. Stop telling us to wear masks when the studies show it's dangerous and it does nothing. We will not wear masks. We will not wear masks even if we're not vaccinated because we're not taking the experimental synthetic injection that you people keep pushing on it. You know, if there was really an emergency, we wouldn't need this propaganda campaign. That concludes public comment. Hey, I'll close public comment on uh, 6.1, bring it back to the council. Any uh, questions or comments? Vice Mayor Monroe. I'm just wondering, um, I, I see that we continue to lag a little bit um, in the numbers and I'm wondering if you've got any thoughts on that, um, Mr. City Manager. So, um, you know, tracking basically overall, overall countywide trends um, that some of the areas in the county that do trail somewhat um, also are those that have populations of uh, low income um, residents uh, and uh, also residents that have English as a second language. The data that we have preliminarily seems to indicate that that is one of the areas um, that is uh, essentially lagging in the overall vaccination rates. And so as you saw on the slide, we are working with the county um, and Stanford Valley Care uh, to uh, both do outreach to those groups in a variety of formats um, and to provide uh, convenient uh, times uh, for um, folks to get vaccinated if they want to. So those are the areas that we are concentrating on now. And you saw sort of our summary of the various channels that we're using. And uh, we will continue to do that. Um, although we're, we are uh, a little behind the county averages there, um, we do continue to make progress every two weeks. So you'll notice that the numbers, of course, have gone up from two weeks ago, and that's up from two weeks before that. So um, the progress we're making continues to be relatively steady at this point. I will, I will just comment on that. Speaking of getting the word out, um, Farmers Market, the city booth at Farmers Market had was distributing those and people did come up and ask. I, I distributed several of them. So um, it, that seems to be one way of, of going about it. So thank you. Council Member Kick. Um, just kind of tailing off what um, Vice Mayor Monroe said, uh, a resident asked me the other day if at, um, when you're getting vaccinated, if they ask about your documentation status, do you know? what the policy is around that, Mark? They do not ask for uh, mm -hmm. your documentation status. You do not have to be a citizen um, to be uh, vaccinated. Um, okay. so you're, you're... I knew that was the case for AXIS and mm -hmm. I just said, go to AXIS. But mm -hmm. if that's the case for everywhere, um, that would be um, good to know. And then just thank you to staff for getting that up so quickly. Um, our new COVID information on the front page was um, the idea of a resident who forwarded it to me and I forwarded it on to staff. And so just thank you for getting that up so quickly. Um, residents are concerned and trying to help and we appreciate that. So thank you. Yeah, I was gonna say uh, thank you as well for uh, getting that up there because uh, of that uh, resident request. Uh, any other comments? I'll just, if not, uh, this was informational. There's nothing for us to uh, vote on. And we're on to, um, and, and I'll just say thank you for all the work you're doing there and uh, flexing through all the different rules and everything else. So we're on now to item 6.2, the uh, Climate Action Plan uh, draft measures. We have a staff report, please. 
Honorable Mayor, this is Mark Roberts, your city manager. And to introduce the item, I'm gonna hand this off to uh, Tricia Ponto, an associate planner, um, to uh, introduce the overall uh, item. So, Tricia. All right, good evening, uh, Mayor and City Council. Can everyone hear me and see my screen? Yes. Great. All right, so we're here tonight to present to you the draft climate action plan measures. The last time we came and presented to you about the climate action plan update was back in January, where we uh, presented the results from some technical analyses that we did to kick off the project. The first was our greenhouse gas em emissions inventory, where we're looking at the sources of emissions in Livermore. Uh, the other was a vulnerability analysis, where we were looking at um, potential climate impacts that Livermore is facing, like extreme heat, um, and wildfires. Um, and so we took all that information and drafted this list of measures, which are the um, strategies and actions that we are proposing to include in the plan. And um, that list has gone through several iterations since the beginning uh, based on community feedback through our outreach and engagement process, um, feedback from the Climate Action Plan Advisory Committee and other stakeholders. Uh, and, the, and the Planning Commission reviewed these last month. Um, so this is kind of where, where we're at for now. Um, we're looking to get your feedback tonight on uh, what you think of the measures, if we're missing anything, um, if there's language that needs clarification, um, things you wouldn't want to see in the plan. Um, and then, so now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick it over to Ryan Gardner from Rincon Consultants, who's going to walk you through some of the more significant measures we have on the list, and then we'll wrap up with some next steps. Great, thanks, Rosha. I think we can skip to the next slide. Um, just a quick overview. I think Trisha mentioned all this, but we'll go through a, a quick update of, um, or an overview of the cap update, uh, talk a little bit about the requirements for a qualified cap, um, get into the key reduction measures um, and actions by sector, and then go over a little bit of what we heard from the community, um, the various outreach we did and, and the responses we heard and how we kind of made adjustments over time. And then Trisha will finish up with some next steps. Um, so I think we can go to the next slide. Um, so just a little refresher, <clears throat> what the Climate Action Plan update is. Um, this is an update to the 2012 um, Livermore Climate Action Plan. And instead of looking at the AB32 goal of a reduction to 1990 levels by 2020, um, this focuses on Senate Bill 32 or SB 32, which requires a 40% reduction from 1990 levels by 2030. Um, and that is a codified um, piece of legislation um, by the state. And then also looking at Executive Order B 5518, which is achieving carbon neutrality as quickly as possible, but no later than 2045, um, which has not yet been codified, but um, the state is moving ahead with uh, new scoping plan updates that will kind of work towards this long-term goal. So it's something that we're um, anticipating becoming codified um, over time. And then also working on Senate Bill 379, which is adaptation of resiliency strategies. Um, and then putting together um, a package, uh, a cap that is considered a qualified greenhouse gas reduction strategy under CEQA. Um, and what this will allow the city to do is streamline new uh, development projects that are consistent with the climate action plan, which is a really big benefit, um, especially since there are no kind of provided greenhouse gas thresholds of significance by the air district or the state at this time. Um, so that's kind of the, the primary driver um, and goal for this project. Next slide. Um, and as Trisha mentioned, uh, last time we were here, we kind of went over a bunch of data um, and showed you the progress um, with the city of Livermore so far. And in this graph, um, that's kind of represented by the dark blue line or the first kind of four dots um, on the graph there. And in general, uh, Livermore has reduced their emissions uh, significantly through 2017. Um, and, and actually achieve their, the 2020 target of had it ahead of time, uh, which is consistent with what the state was able to do as well. Um, and then from that 2017 um, period, forecasting forward, we kind of have the first line uh, going upwards in a linear trend is our business as usual forecast, which shows um, how emissions would go 
over time if we didn't change anything but continue to, to grow. Um, and then the dotted blue, or sorry, dashed blue line below that is our adjusted forecast, which includes state legislation like SB 100, which is 100% carbon-free electricity by 2045, um, Title 24, um, advanced clean cars and things like that. Um, and then that triangle about midway down, that is the um, kind of minimum target to be consistent with SB 32. And that's a 40% reduction from the 1990 emission level. Um, but through working with the KPAC um, and other stakeholders, um, the current target that was suggested is a, a linear reduction to carbon neutrality on a per capita basis. Um, and that is represented by this orange line, uh, which you see is, is a little more stringent than the state's SB 32 target. Um, but because it's per capita, it also gives you the flexibility um, to continue to grow over time um, and really focus on decarbonizing the systems within the city rather than worrying about um, if your emissions went up because you grew a lot more than expected. So it kind of adds a little flexibility there. Um, and then finally, the kind of big dashed, uh, I guess it's green line, represents how your emissions um, are projected to go once we account for all of the um, carbon or greenhouse gas reduction measures that we're going to go through tonight. So in order to hit the 2030 target, um, we needed to come up with a reductions of approximately 118,000 metric tons uh, per year by 2030. Um, and with the current suite of measures, we're at about 122,000 or almost 123,000. So we've got about 4,500 metric tons of CO2e um, that we're able to play with at this point or just a little bit of buffer to ensure we hit that target in 2030. Um, but then you also see in 2045, there's still a pretty decent gap um, between where we are projected to end up with our current batch of measures and carbon neutrality. Um, and that's okay. We, we expect that um, this plan is really expected to kind of be updated every five years or so. Um, and we'll be able to make changes as technology changes, as the state changes their um, legislation and kind of works on that scoping plan I was mentioning um, to kind of close that gap over time. So we don't wanna try too hard to plan all the way out to 2045 today because things are changing so quickly. Um, so if you go on to the next slide, um, this just gives a little bit of a summary of, of where our greenhouse gas emission reductions are coming from. So we're that 122,000 metric tons um, we expect to be able to get. 57% um, coming from energy. So that's um, our buildings, uh, electricity, natural gas. 37% from transportation through, um, we'll see electric vehicles and VMT reduction or vehicle miles traveled. Um, waste about 6%, uh, mostly from SB 1383 implementation, uh, which is organic subversion. And then less than 1% from carbon sequestration. Um, but as we'll see, there's a lot of really great co-benefits associated with a lot of those projects. Um, so let's move on to the next one. So when we went ahead and started to develop our, our measures and the associated actions, um, we used these kind of cornerstone measures or um, these key pillars to help identify which actions should support these reductions. Um, so we came up with a handful of cornerstone measures that really represent um, the key strategies towards getting to carbon neutrality. So we want to make sure that for every measure that there's educational components, um, structural change, really quantifiable greenhouse gas reductions, equity, um, building on partnerships, and making sure it's cost effective. So each measure that we developed, um, we worked to come up with a suite of actions, uh, both with the KPAC or the, um, and the community and stakeholders to make sure all those pieces came together so we could have really implementable um, and impactful greenhouse gas reduction measures. Uh, next slide. So the first kind of cornerstone um, strategy or measure that we identified 
um, is building electrification for new construction. So this is just focused on new construction um, and it would be banning natural gas in all new building construction by 2022. Um, with some exemptions for industrial or um, difficult to electrify or, or not feasibly electrified uh, building types. Um, so this is good for about almost 11,000 metric tons. And this is really important because it's gonna limit our investment in um, fossil fuel infrastructure. That's gonna cost money over time. Um, and the other great thing about this is new building electrification is generally less expensive um, than mixed fuel construction um, and provides a bunch of other co-benefits like health, um, air quality benefits and things like that. So underneath this, there's a, a bunch of core actions like adopting an ordinance, um, finishing a, a cost effectiveness study um, and then developing a case-by-case -case allowance for certain um, site development standards when all electric is shown to be infeasible. Uh, next slide. And then supporting this are other kind of the second part of our three measure set of cornerstone measures um, is beginning to look at existing buildings. Um, so no mandatory requirements around existing buildings um, through the first part of this climate action plan um, and really taking the time to start looking at the incentives, looking, getting voluntary buy-in um, to this process and then conducting a feasibility study to identify where building electrification really makes sense um, and what the opportunities are for funding and financing to make it cost effective um, to move those buildings over to all electric in the future, um, which will allow them to become zero carbon as well. Um, and this represents a, a much bigger chunk of emissions, um, up to 34,000, um, just because so many existing buildings are already um, in the building stock but quite a bit of work here in the short term to really hammer it home or really get a better handle on what the major costs um, and benefit flows are gonna be for Livermore. So really um, city specific numbers that we need to figure out regarding um, anything from the year, the vintage of the buildings, the types of panels there are, the types of appliances there generally are, and that'll all be part of this kind of first phase um, of fact finding. And then the next measure, please. And then kind of finally to wrap all of these together um, is moving to 100% carbon-free electricity um, prior to 2025. Um, and that is going to not only reduce emissions um, by you know, almost 25,000 metric tons per year alone, um, it's also going to continue to reduce emissions as we electrify uh, vehicles and buildings. So um, one of the great things about electrification is that as we move from fossil fuels um, and switch over to electricity, when we pair that with carbon-free electricity, we then have that carbon-free um, or zero carbon um, piece of equipment, whether it's your car or your, your hot water heater. Um, so this is really a, a major pathway towards working towards carbon neutrality. Um, and we do have East Bay Community Choice Energy, which offers um, carbon-free and renewable um, opt-up options. And that's something that the city could do as a whole, and then people can opt out if they didn't wanna be in that program. Um, so this kind of trio of measures really shows the systems that we can put in place to decarbonize the city, um, still be able to develop, still have really high performing buildings um, and get a lot of co-benefits at the same time, like air quality and health benefits in the home. Um, next slide, please. Um, so then I'm also gonna get into uh, some of our other key mitigation measures. Um, there are quite a few here, but a bunch more in our um, full list. And then an entire substantial evidence section um, which is Appendix C to the Climate Action Plan that really goes through all of the references, um, scientific studies um, and calculations for how we got these greenhouse gas reduction numbers um, and also really references to any of the assumptions that we made while we were coming up with um, these measures. Um, so next slide. So start off with transportation. Um, Improving active transportation infrastructure to achieve greater than 7% mode shift away from passenger vehicles by 2030 and maintain that through 2045, um, good for about 2,000 metric tons. 
Um, really the core action here is implementing the um, Bicycle, Pedestrian and Trails Active Transportation Plan adopted in 2013. Um, this is gonna be a pretty big lift um, and the metric tons reduction is, and the, and the mode shift is not super high, um, but there are a lot of really great co-benefits, um, health, air quality, lower costs, um, less traffic, less congestion. Um, so really the first approach or the first thing we wanna do with, with um, transportation is kind of reduce the amount of vehicles on the road as much as possible, because um, that helps alleviate a lot of other problems as well. Um, next slide. Um, and then once we kind of get vehicles off the road, um, we'll also have another kind of transit related measure after this, but the other kind of opportunity to reduce emissions from transportation um, is through electrification. So this is uh, a much larger potential reduction, uh, upwards almost 40,000 metric tons through 2030. Um, and this is through a really significant shift away from internal combustion vehicles to um, electric vehicles. And since the city can't really, you know, require electric vehicles or, or make any ordinance or mandate there, really what we're looking to do is ensure that the um, folks in the community have an opportunity to charge their electric vehicle. And one of the major gaps right now in electric vehicle charging is multifamily housing, especially new construction. So we have some ordinance that ordinances there that would kind of link in with the new building construction ordinance for electrification to require more EV charging um, at those multifamily and commercial developments, um, and then streamline the EV infrastructure process. So making sure that as um, the community switches over, that there's plenty of opportunity to charge those vehicles and kind of help reduce range anxiety. Um, next measure. And then, as I said, measure T3, um, reducing VMT through for passenger vehicles by 2% by 2030 and 4% by 2045 through transit, um, 3,000 metric tons. And this is, <clears throat> there's already quite a good infrastructure for um, transit within the city. Um, with COVID and kind of where we are currently, it's pretty difficult to, to get these numbers or expect them to be much higher. Um, so they might seem a little lower than what you'd expect. I think there is a lot of potential in the city to work on these, but we try to be pretty conservative with the assumptions just because of the, um, the uncertainty moving forward with how people are gonna be interacting with public transportation. Um, but we have great partners with LAFTA and BART and ACE um, new transit coming to the city and then also working on a transportation system management plan for new construction that's really going to help shift away um, some of that behavior or single occupancy vehicle behavior towards transit and that links up with SB 743 um, and the VMT requirements for new construction anyway so kind of nice uh, combination there. Uh, next slide. On the waste side, um, like I said, really focusing on SB 1383, um, which is a major requirement from the state uh, to achieve a 75% reduction in organic waste from 2014 levels by 2025, um, 7,500 metric tons. Um, and this is really focusing on updating waste hauler contracts, um, which is already underway or, or kind of has been completed. Um, and then implementing inspection and compliance programs for edible food recovery, which is another portion of SB 1383 to ensure we're diverting as much organics, preferably um, edible food before it gets into the waste stream um, to good uses like food recovery programs. Um, so that's really tearing off of what's required by the state, um, but working with partners like Stop Waste and others to make sure that this is happening um, at the right speed in, in Livermore. Um, next page, please. And then carbon sequestration, um, looking to maximize local carbon sequestration by increasing urban canopy at least 10% by 2030 and preserving existing open spaces and developing carbon farming projects. Um, so the relatively small metric ton reduction you see here um, is tied to a, a specific number of trees. Um, I think it's uh, moving from like 2,500 to 3,500 city owned trees by 2030. Um, but I think there's a lot of um, 
a lot more potential in carbon farming and even tree planting within the city overall, um, getting to that 10% number that we could kind of boost these numbers up um, a bit more once we have more data on what the current uh, kind of level of carbon sequestration there is. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the adaptation measures as well and just tree planting and how that plays into urban heat island effect um, and just making the city a, a nicer place to be um, and improving yeah, the overall, how we move around the city. Um, so a lot of co-benefits here above and beyond just the metric ton reduction. Uh, next slide. So getting into the adaptation measures, um, just a reminder, kind of the core vulnerabilities that we um, identified during the vulnerability analysis um, is extreme heat. So um, as we're kind of seeing already, higher temperatures and longer uh, heat waves also worried about flooding, more extreme um, precipitation events, water supply. So even while it's raining more here, um, less snow falling in the Sierras, really low um, groundwater and uh, aquifer and reservoir levels, and even like saltwater intrusion in the Delta up north are all kind of impacting uh, Livermore and the ability to get potable water. Um, and water for agriculture. And then finally, wildfire smoke and wildfire, where maybe not such a huge increase in wildfires, specifically in Livermore or around Livermore, um, but definitely more impact from wildfire smoke from fires that are expected to be kind of throughout the state and even um, across the country that can all blow in here. So those are kind of the core vulnerabilities that we're working against. Um, next slide, please. So measure 81 is looking at water use efficiency, um, updating the recycled water master plan, looking at seeing how we can get more recycled water, um, reusing the water that we're treating here in the valley, um, enforcing the water efficient landscape ordinance, which is an existing ordinance that kind of doesn't get followed up on maybe quite as much as it could. Um, and then even looking into the restriction of potable water for non potable uses for large water users, um, especially like landscape irrigation and things like that. Um, next slide. Um, flooding, um, looking at increasing the use of permeable surfaces throughout Livermore to reduce flood risk from storms. So infiltration, recharging groundwater, um, also reducing the amount of stormwater that potentially goes to um, cause damage. So it could be from permeable surfaces that are natural, like a bioswale or working with living arroyos, um, or it could be, uh, you know, changing out hardscapes to permeable pavements or pavers. Um, definitely different costs and, and impacts surrounding those, but um, requiring new development to include at least 20% permeable hardscapes, um, which is consistent with Cal Green Tier 1 is one of the kind of core actions there. Uh, next slide. Also around flooding, continuing to improve stormwater management throughout the city to reduce risks of future floods. So um, kind of expanding on um, and implementing what the city is already working on with the green infrastructure plan, um, and then expanding passive rain capture features. So as we're kind of redesigning stormwater, working on these projects, making sure that we're sizing them for um, the storms that we expect to have, not the storms we're having today or, or we're having 10 years ago. Uh, next slide. On the fire and smoke side, um, first kind of mitigating wildfire risk in Livermore to the extent feasible. Um, and improving disaster preparedness and awareness. So stockpiling personal protective equipment like masks, uh, creating fire safe development and landscape standards, especially in the urban wildland interface. So kind of on the boundaries of the city um, and then creating clean air centers that double as cooling centers so that folks who maybe can't escape the high heat or escape the, um, the smoke who maybe are, have compromised um, breathing abilities can go somewhere, be safe, um, get clean air, get cooled down, um, even in the case of a, of a big wildfire. Uh, next slide. Extreme heat, um, increasing resiliency and preparedness to extreme heat events by prioritizing the protection of public health for vulnerable populations. Um, so developing a heat vulnerability index and mitigation plan. So kind of understanding at which level we're going to start to see health impacts to vulnerable populations. Um, increasing the resilience at those cooling and air quality centers with backup power. So looking at um, microgrid deployment, 
um, with battery storage and even renewable energy like solar, um, so that even in the case of a um, power safety shutoff, people have a place to go that's cool and clean and safe. Um, and then also expanding heat pump retrofits, which is an electrification strategy, um, but those heat pumps provide both uh, heating and cooling. So we get kind of a double benefit of more efficiency and more resiliency by moving over to that, um, especially for maybe lower income um, or kind of substandard housing that may not have air conditioning currently. Uh, next slide. Um, kind of general resilience, assessing the resiliency of public and private buildings throughout the city to climate related disasters and seeking partnerships with relevant stakeholders to reduce vulnerabilities. Um, again, kind of taking a, a better assessment or stock of the public um, and private buildings within the city, looking at opportunities for microgrids at the cooling center or city hall, um, starting to work on local and regional grid reliability. Um, so that could be partnerships with the labs um, or with the utilities, PG&E or um, EBCE to kind of see if we can get local energy generation um, to kind of help through um, if there are power safety shutoffs in the area. Um, and then looking at weatherization, tree planting, um, and those heat pump installations in low income housing stock. Uh, next slide. And then 87, ensuring that Livermore is prepared to respond to climate related hazards, making it a standard consideration during planning and development processes. And this is kind of just institutionalizing um, the forward thinking um, when doing planning or building infrastructure so that we are building to what we know, what we think could kind of happen in the future rather than what the current conditions are. Um, we've kind of seen already things are, are changing pretty quickly um, and even making sure that the infrastructure we're installing can take high temperatures or can take uh, larger flood events. Um, it's gonna be really important to save money and resources uh, in the future. Uh, next slide. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a high level overview of the, the measures um, and key actions that we have. Like I said, there's, there's a lot more to that. It kind of rounds those out um, in the full summary, um, but I'll move into a little bit of what we've heard the, from the community so far. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Um, I think probably the, the biggest concern we've heard is just the upfront costs of, um, of things in general, but specifically around existing building electrification, um, particularly for low income residents. Um, and in response to that, we've definitely pulled back um, any kind of action in the short term that would require anyone to make changes to their existing buildings um, and really focus on identifying the funding and financing support um, that would allow that to happen in a cost-effective manner, or even at you know, no cost at time of replacement. Um, so in the short term, really looking at voluntary actions rather than um, anything that would require a, a large upfront cost. Um, again, on the cost side, um, just concern over the cost of the measures and the approach being taken. Um, and how, how that is going to happen over time. And in response, not only do we have a full um, funding and financing strategy for the largest cost measures, um, we've also developed a measure cost technical appendix, which really clearly highlights how much these measures cost and, and really what the variables are, um, because kind of giving a single number to any one of these things is extremely difficult and really not almost not relevant because there are a lot of ways to approach that um, and, and this measure um, technical appendix kind of goes into detail on all the different variables that go into determining costs what the funding and financing options are um, and we'll be presenting that to the kpac um, in the coming weeks um, so that will be probably coming your way or be more publicly available um, after that meeting um, we've also heard a lot about more um, need for more improved transit convenience, connectivity, more connected and safer bike network. Um, so we work to include a lot of those active transportation and transit related measures um, into, the, into the cap as well. Um, next slide. Again, a lot 
of um, concern around costs and how these are going to be actually implemented. And I think the funding and financing plan from HIP Investor goes a long way to kind of um, get that included. Um, a lot of concern, or not concern, but suggestions to really leverage local strengths like homeowners associations, the labs, BART, ACE Transit. Um, so kind of throughout these measures, work to identify the, the stakeholders and the partners that are going to help get these measures implemented. The city really can't act on their own um, for all of these. It's, it's going to take a bigger approach or even a regional approach. Um, and then originally had some um, draft measures around a time of sale requirement. Um, and that was fairly unpopular. So that has been pulled out of the, of the program as well. Um, and we're really just looking at um, possibilities for incentives or something like transfer tax rebate at time of sale to help fund um, some voluntary electrification upgrades um, or even safety upgrades. Uh, next slide. Oh, and I'll turn it over back to Trisha. All right, thanks, Ryan. Um, so yeah, just want to go over our next steps that we have for um, finishing the plan. So we're going to do a little bit more of community outreach around the electrification topic because that seems to be getting the most interest in the community. And we are already moving forward with our uh, new construction ordinance. So we really want to get out and have some conversations with the community around that topic specifically. Um, and then we'll finalize these cap measures. And like Ryan was talking about um, preparing the costs, funding and financing plans, uh, the options that are available for us to pay for these measures. Um, then we'll also prepare an implementation plan. Um, who's responsible for what? What time frame do we expect to accomplish these different measures? Um, and then that, all of that information, along with an outreach summary and the inventory and the vulnerability analysis, all of these different pieces will get put together in the actual draft climate action plan. And we will do our, our CEQA analysis on the plan and then hopefully have it back to council at, by the end of the year for um, adoption. Um, and then just a reminder, our recommendation is that you uh, provide some direction to us this evening on the measures and that concludes our presentation. We're available for questions. Okay, uh, thank you. And before we go to questions, I'll open uh, public comment. I wanna say a, a very comprehensive uh, presentation and um, thanks for being responsive on the issue with respect to the concern about electrification of existing buildings. So with that, uh, can we uh, go to the public comment now, please? Yes, Mayor, there are four public comment requests. The first speaker is John Collins, followed by Alan Marland and Jackie Coda. John Collins, please unmute yourself. John Collins, please unmute yourself. So why don't we go to the next one? We can come back if uh, Mr. Collins can figure out how to unmute. Yes, Mayor. The next speaker is Alan Marlin, followed by Jackie Coda and Michigan Ghost. Alan Marlin, please unmute yourself. Hello, this is Alan Marlin, Livermore resident. Uh, I love visiting local Livermore area recreational parks and East Bay parks. I love the good air and the blue skies, and I try to savor them as much as I can because I know how fleeting it can be. Uh, I love our Golden Hills in Round Livermore, and I love it when they turn green in the spring. What I don't like are Black Hills destroyed by wildfires. What I don't like are vineyards left as smoking blackened stumps. What I don't like is feeling trapped inside because the air itself is poisonous due to the ever-increasing and worsening fire seasons. Uh, when the air cleans, I certainly clears. It, it has this crystalline, beautiful uh, quality, but even then I feel short of breath after these fire seasons from the damage done to my lungs from the fiery air. Um, we used to say we're fighting climate change to save our future, but now really the future is now and the cl climate crisis is here, so we're fighting for our present. Um, and during this climate crisis, I often feel helpless, like we can't do enough, there's nothing I can do, but which is why I'm using my voice today to urge you to take every action 
is in your power to help stop climate change to stop the worsening effects of the year. And many community members have voiced their concerns about the costs of taking these actions. Uh, while certainly we want to keep costs down and be as efficient as possible, the cost of doing nothing is far greater than anything we spent to prevent this damage from taking place. If the sky is orange and it's raining ash, I'm certainly not going to go outside to patronize local businesses. If businesses burn down, that's a high cost. And cost to ourselves, to our health is incredibly high and to our beautiful landscapes. So look, uh, I urge council to do all they can. And also on this topic, I want to say that as staff mentioned, local clean energy for a localized microgrid is critical, which is why I call on the Friends of Livermore and Friends of Open Space and Vineyards to withdraw their lawsuits against Armas Solar Farm. Thank you. The next speaker is Jackie Coda, followed by Michigan Ghost and John Collins. Jackie Coda, please unmute yourself. Well, here we go again. More punitive measures on these residents of Livermore due to a theory that is unfounded. We are not in a climate crisis. We have never been in a climate crisis. And the lying bureaucrats have been trying to fearmonger us for years. We don't have an electrical grid that can sustain everything turning over to electricity. What are you gonna do with these high performing buildings when they can't even run when there's brownouts or blackouts? You know, the NOAA has made repeated adjustments to its data for the presumed scientific reasons for making the data sets more accurate. So nothing wrong with that, except all their changes point to one thing lowering previous measured temperatures to show cooler weather in the past and raising more recent temperature to show warming in the recent present. This creates a data illusion of ever rising temperatures to match the increasing CO2 Earth's atmosphere since the mid 1800s, which global warming advocates say is a cause and effect relationship. The more CO2, the more warming. Guess what? Your models have never been proven. The actual measured temperature records show something different. There've been hot years, and hot decades since the turn of the last century, and colder years and colder decades. But the overall measured temperature shows no clear trend over the last century, and at least not one suggests runaway warming. So until the NOA statisticians adjust the data, using complex statistical models, they change the data to reflect not reality, but their underlying theories of global warming. That's clear from the simple fact of statistics. Data generated random errors, which cancel out over time by averaging data, the errors mostly disappear. So why is it that our bureaucrats keep pushing this? You know, there's initiative to reduce carbon emissions, I understand that, but this could impoverish already struggling Californians by raising the cost of housing by thousands and thousands of dollars. Your climate action plan needs to be absolutely destroyed because changing over everything from gas to electricity is unsustainable. And if you decide to do that, then the city should front the cost for everything, personal, private property, and public property. The modeling tells us that 100% renewable electricity alone isn't enough to help us meet our 2030 greenhouse gas reduction goals. So why is it that we're still focused on this? You know, I understand clean energy is great, but why is it that you guys continue to penalize people and you try and destroy people's lives with terrible policies. It's ridiculous and we're sick of it and we're tired of the lies. There is no global climate crisis. Just like in the seventies, there was no global freezing. It's an agenda 21 effort that's now been since moved to agenda 2030. We know your goals. The next speaker is Michigan Ghost followed by John Collins. Michigan Ghost, please unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, I'm Roger Logan. My remarks are for item 6.2, draft climate action plan. On overpopulation, the cap is still based on Livermore population increase of 40% by 2045. Why? Encouraging overpopulation is wrong for the climate. California just lost a house seat, so why would any plan assume a population increase? Taking that out makes it easier to meet any climate goal. 
By the way, per capita is the wrong climate metric. If Sacramento is pushing a reckless population agenda, we will support city council in pushing back. But don't push Sacramento's overpopulation whims on us by appeasing them. On word salad mandates, the new explore language now just sounds snipey and hateful. The implications for threatened requirements and mandates and even timelines are still there. The passive aggressive, when cost effective, et cetera, language is disturbing because in reality, only the homeowner can and will determine what is cost effective because it's their money. So the cost effectiveness wording in the cap draft is just extra word salad, adding only the potential for misuse and confusion. Better if just taken out. I feel like sampling Polk Salad Annie into word salad mandate. I also strongly suggest city council look at the pie chart made by a cap member showing that on next door, 85% of people are opposed to mandates for existing homes including word salad. The passive aggressive explore and requirement wording still in the cap draft needs to go. References to a permit clock of 2025 are still in appendix B. The concept of an insidious campaign of permit denial with the goal of picking off one homeowner at a time starting in 2025 is culturally offensive to many of us and has no place in a Livermore plan. To summarize, the wrong ideas are still in the cap draft. Examples, plan and encourage overpopulation, threaten, explore, require mandates for existing homes. The right ideas are not in the cap draft. Examples, stable population, biggest single factor to help the climate. A detailed list of real solar and battery installs with costs and timelines. Remember the $75,000 estimate that I made a couple months ago to do it all, including a solar roof and battery, which you will need to do the rest of it. That is not to be ignored and it's an, it's an incredible cost for most people. Thank you very much. The next speaker is John Collins and is the second attempt. John Collins, please unmute yourself. Yes, this is John Collins. I'd like to know why we're going to, from voluntary compliance, a, a voluntary uh, reduce, voluntarily re reduce our gas usage to, man to a mandatory plan. The current climate action plan uses vol voluntary uh, measures, while the while the while the current the current one doesn't. Let me give give you an example. Let me read from page six of the draft plan, action number two. It states performing existing building electrification feasibility and cost, or, and cost in order to understand the potential for an association cost of electrification retrofitting in the city of Livermore and establish a plan for eliminating natural gas from existing buildings. Again, we're using mandatory. Let me bring up another issue on the same page, on item number one, again, page six. It states, study the conversion of gas to electric appliances, monitor market trends, and when it becomes cost effective compared to natural gas alternatives, consider a requirement to replace gas appliances and electrical with electrical alternatives in an associated home addition and remodel, when a home addition and remodel occurred. So again, mandatory for people who want to put an extension on their home. Uh, and one, one issue I have with this is that it says cost effective. What's the definition of cost effective? That, th that this term has to be definite, has to be defined, and has to be specific. Otherwise, in a city employer can come on, can, can interpret it anyway, to, to, in, in order to uh, hurt homeowners. Let me read one more item here from item number three of the same page. Leverage partnerships with stockholders such as EBC and PG&E to establish funding pathways to ease community members' costs when complying with the electrification ordinance. 
this should be not, there should be no no costs associated with this. If the city wants to mandate this, the city must pay for it, not you or I or anyone else. This is just an, another example of the city trying to push its costs on homeowners. And you people on the city city council should remember this. You, we are not gonna vote for you. You'll be voted out if you consider put, pushing these costs on homeowners. I rest my case, thank you. That concludes public comments. Okay, I'll close uh, public comment on this item, bring it back to the council. Uh, do I have anybody who wishes to uh, ask questions or comment? Councilmember Bonanno? Yeah, I have uh, a couple questions and then um, I'll make a few comments. Um, first, um, just really want to thank our staff, Ms. Ponto, and our consultant, Rincon, for Mr. Gardner, for all the work they've done on this. Um, I think there's an incredible amount of, of research and thought that's been put into this draft. So um, re really appreciate all the effort. It, it's obvious to me that it's been very thoughtfully put together. Um, also, Planning Commission, I thought their comments uh, from the meeting, their meeting a month or so ago were very helpful to me to hear uh, their perspective and they gave a lot of detailed input and, and insight and I thought that was quite helpful in my review and also to the climate action planning uh, advisory committee for their efforts. So my question, part of my question was answered um, with respect to I, I wanted to really understand what what is the state requiring, how are they influencing what we're doing, um, are they I know there are some CEQA streamlining benefits that were mentioned. I think Mr. Gardner went through some of the Senate and assembly bills that are driving this, but it still isn't clear to me, you know, is this a carrot or a stick exercise? Are they incentivizing us to comply? Are they penalizing us for not complying? I just want to kind of understand the state's, state's role in, in how we develop this plan. Um, related question, what's a reach code? And quite, uh, that was mentioned in one of the slides. I'd like to understand that. And then the third piece of my question um, is, is the state saying anything on adaptation? Because I think some of our ad adaptation issues, um, the things that are really gonna affect our community members, you know, maybe later this year um, with respect to intense excessive heat waves. I'd like to understand whether the, the state is saying anything on adaptation. Um, they're been pretty strong in some of their bills on mitigation. So that, that's my question. And then I would like to make a couple comments. Honorable Council Member uh, Bonanno, I'm going to uh, turn it back to uh, Trish to start off the answers and then have her uh, include our, our consultant team as well as needed. Yeah, so I'm going to start off and then let Ryan fill in the pieces. We do have state requirements for adaptation and resiliency planning. There is new legislation that requires cities to um, think about climate adaptation planning, and that can be done as part of the general plan or as part of local climate action plans. And so that's sort of what we, the path that we've taken since we are already um, updating our climate action plan, um, decided to expand the scope to include adaptation and resiliency planning. There are state, there is state legislation around GHG reduction goals and targets. Um, it's, it doesn't say that the city absolutely has to do that, but you know, we we're trying to do our part to help the state reach its goals. Um, around the CEQA stuff, I'm going to let Ryan from Rincon um, cover that piece of it and um, also the reach code part. Yeah, so kind of echoing Trish, um, there's no specific requirement from the state that says you know, every city must complete a climate action plan or every city must reach their this overall target. It does say that the state on a whole must reach that target. Um, and what they do is kind of provide the carrot of CEQA streamlining um, and a little bit of a stick of not providing any um, other clear way to do that. Um, at this time, where in the past they had given kind of thresholds um, to work off of. So a little bit of both, um, but again, no, no specific requirement does allow you to um, achieve grant funding, more competitive in those areas as well, which is a nice um, added benefit. And then the REACH code is just a, an addition beyond Title 24. So in California, um, every city is able to um, adopt a REACH code, which 
essentially is a, a more stringent version of the California state codes code. So more energy efficient, um, as long as it's deemed to be cost effective. Um, and that cost effectiveness is designed defined as a time dependent valuation model, um, which kind of looks at people's costs over time. So the savings from construction, the on bill costs, um, but also infrastructure costs overall. Um, so it kind of takes a, a longer life cycle approach to that cost effectiveness number. And I think that was everything, but let me know if I missed something. Um, I don't want to dwell on it, but I didn't quite understand your explanation of a reach code or what, what, what is that? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? And what is it, what's its benefit if it's a good thing? I, I just didn't quite get it. But if, if you have a simpler way of, of describing it, go, go ahead. If not, I'll, I will um, get to somebody offline. Sorry. Yeah, it, it's, it is a, um, it's a good thing, I guess, if you're looking to have a more energy efficient building code. So it, it goes beyond the current requirement um, to require more energy efficiency um, so long as it's cost effective is, is the definition. Okay, okay, interesting. All right, that, that's a little clear, thank you. Um, the other thing, uh, I do have one more question. I think you, I think you helped me on the, uh, the state's influence on what we're doing. Um, back on one of your first charts where you showed um, the, you don't need to go back to it unless it's helpful, but there's the business as usual curve, which goes up. Um, and then there's the adjusted forecast. And then there's the, the plan forecast. I forget what language you use there. What is, what, what's taking us from the business as usual to the adjusted forecast? Are those things that we're doing um, like we're getting cleaner energy from our from our sources. Are we? Is it some projected adoption of EV vehicles? I mean, what what's the? Okay, if it helps, it'll go back. Yeah. So the two the two color. Forget business as usual. The one below it. How how do we get there? What what's the? Yeah. So going from the gray business as usual line to that blue um, line below it. Yeah. So from business as usual to adjusted. That is the state's current legislation. So that includes Senate Bill 100, which is the renewable portfolio standard. So that's increasing um, electricity, uh, I guess, increasing portion of electricity that is carbon free um, up to 100% in 2045. And then also some adoption of electric vehicles based on the current legislation. Um, so the advanced clean cars um, standard is in there. Um, and some, some vehicle efficiency, so just more efficient internal combustion vehicles over time. Um, also has uh, the, net, the current Title 24 in there. Um, I'm trying to think if there's one else that I missed. But are these included in the, our measures? I mean, is, 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 the, is the reduction that we go from business to usual to, to that curve, is that? As we go so, yeah, yeah, the difference between the first line, the gray line, and the next one down is that's just from the state. And then, so you're still shy of your target um, of that 40% reduction. So the next gap between that blue line and the green one is what the measures okay, in the plan reduce. We get the benefit of getting to that middle curve by what the state's giving us in the way of clean energy or what, what our providers are giving us. Exactly. And our measures get us to the, the next curve, the adjusted admissions forecast. Okay. Um, so let's see, I, I'm going to just make a couple comments. I know other people want to, want to speak as well. So I, 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 I see in the report that we're going to get in the final plan, we're going to have something that's more resource loaded. We're going to do the analysis of the cost, which I assume is not just for the electrification pieces, it's for all the measures. Um, I think that's that's vitally important so that we can make good choices about how what, what we do and what priority and 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 how much this is going to cost. Um, I, I did appreciate several comments in the planning commission minutes as well as, well as um, one of the individuals that spoke in public comment on this that the price of doing nothing um, is, pro is is incredibly high as well. So I, I think that that needs to be kept in mind when we finally get some detailed financial data on on what these measures will cost. Um, so I think also that going from what we have today to a final plan that has implementation, which I would assume has some schedule aspect to it, cost, and perhaps some 
proposal on, on priority and, and risk assessment, I think is gonna be a lot of work. So getting from where we are today to the end of the year with all that, I think is, is gonna be quite an undertaking. So what I'm looking for um, in the final plan, well, I think we have a really thorough and, and rich in content set of measures. I think we need to integrate them in some kind of a roadmap that we can all sort of follow to see how these things play together and where we are in time versus how much we spend on which of these measures and we're gonna to need to make some priority decisions. I mean, when we, when ultimately this will come back to us, I assume in the form of work packages, right? We'll end up, this is not gonna be a plan that we just put on the shelf. This is a plan we're gonna execute and we're gonna to have to add, add resources to this plan. And in order to do that, I think we're gonna to have to make some tough choices about balancing, very, balancing and prioritizing various measures, for example, you know, how are we going to decide whether we funding cooling centers during excessive heat waves, whether we're going to spend money on installing more AV chargers, whether we're going to improve walk and a bikeability of the city, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, these are all things we're going to have to trade off. So I just think the details um, that we're going to expect in this final plan um, will be very important for us to be able to finally move, move out on this, on this important effort. Um, I would think that some aspect of this could be managed like the asset management program where what we did was we did an assessment of risk. The committee and staff put together an assessment of risk. It came back to the council and resources were allocated based on a prioritization, again, that was based on risk. So some, some method, some process is going to have to be adopted to work through that so that we can make good decisions. And my third thing I'm looking for is some sense, and again, this is in the final plan, some sense of how we're gonna measure ourselves against these and also how are we going to report. Um, I'd like to see in, in every project we do in this city, some assessment of impact to climate. Um, how, and how, how are the things we're doing in this project? How are they advancing our measures? How are they taking us toward our goal or away from our goals? Um, so these are all things that I think are, um, sizable amount of work that has to be done from where we're starting, which is a really great set of measures. Again, I think the work that's been done is really tremendous, but I, I think there's got to be a focus now on integrating it into a roadmap that, that we can all sort of follow. So I know other people have things they want to say. I, I'd like to propose that perhaps um, myself and perhaps uh, Councilmember Carling, who we've both been working with the labs on various things on this topic and been pretty interested in, in this um, in the plans so far um, that maybe we form a little bit of a focus group. We could check in occasionally with staff through the course of putting together this roadmap, um, if that's something that everybody agrees that we need. And, um, you know, just just have a little bit of a, uh, a role to play in getting to the final product. So with that, I think I'll quit and get some thoughts and comments from other, other council members. Thank you, uh, council member Carling. Yes, thank you. Uh, I agree with uh, my colleague and would be glad to uh, participate with her on this. I spent my career at Sandia working on energy related topics of one kind or another. So it's something near and dear to my heart. Uh, so I would, uh, I'd certainly, if that would be the pleasure of the council, I'd certainly like to do that. I'll make a few other comments um, uh, tonight uh, with regard to the plan as it stands, I, I happen to agree with Mr. Logan and Mr. Collins. I, um, I appreciate the fact that uh, we've softened uh, measure E2, but I think um, to their point, you know, cost effective to whom? And who decides whether it's gonna be cost effective or not? And so I think, you know, the language around that one, I think, uh, there needs still to be some work on that because I, you know, it, it still strikes me as being uh, confusing uh, to many. You know, I'm, as everybody knows, I'm an avid cyclist and I'm, I'm bringing this up only in the sense of a uh, sort of a theme is I think it's fine to create more bike paths and put trees around them and so on and so forth. But if people don't use them, then we're not going to achieve what, we're, what the goal is. And so somehow I think, uh, again, additional bike paths is fine, but if we don't change people's behavior in terms of using their vehicles, 
um, and getting out and biking or walking more, using public transit and so on, we're not going to have the impact that we want. And so I think it's fine to uh, suggest uh, creating more bike paths, but I, I think we need to focus on what are those measures that we could take that would change people's behavior to use the bike paths that we want to create. And again, that's just an example of things that have come to my mind as I read this. Let me look at 1383. I was going to bring this up under matters, but as long as it's come up uh, during um, this topic, I thought it'd be worthwhile to, to let everybody know. I know that Ryan mentioned Stop Waste, and he's right about that. This has been, I think, 25% of the Stop Waste budget for this fiscal year is going toward 1383 and trying to get the county uh, and the jurisdictions, the various cities within the county to meet the uh, goal, because this becomes implementable January 1st of 2022. And so just to um, let you know, and I was gonna pass this along to the council uh, at the end of this meeting, but uh, just to let you know that the new uh, executive director of Stop Waste has been, um, has provided some new information from Cal Recycle. And there's some information for electeds on Cal Recycle. I'll get you the uh, email about how to uh, address 1383 and how we may work together to, um, to uh, fight climate change through the uh, uh, reduction in uh, organic waste. So again, I'll, I'll pass that along to the council uh, at the end of the meeting. The other thing that has occurred to me um, is our, there must be measures that we can take within the city to show the public that we're taking the lead on this. You know, some examples that have come to my mind are the use of renewable fuels for our diesel uh, vehicles. And I know this is something that I've brought up before, discussed with the city manager, but I think those are the kinds of things that I think we can um, implement citywide, even in the talk back, uh, I think somebody brought up microgrids. And I think that was on the, uh, at least someplace in the draft that I read, talked about putting like city hall or the police department or something on a microgrid. Again, I think that we ought to look, and maybe this is something that if, um, if uh, council member Bonanno and I work on this, we, you know, think, think about the things that we could do within the city again, that would show the leadership from the city staff, the electeds and so on, moving us forward in terms of addressing climate. But again, I, there's a lot of ideas that I have. I don't wanna bore people with this evening, uh, but I do think there's things that we could do as a city uh, to lead the effort in terms of uh, addressing climate change. But uh, again, getting back to um, Council Member Bonanno's Suggestion, I'd be glad to participate with her if that's the pleasure of the council. Thank you. Okay, I uh, just for the other uh, council members, uh, you know, I heard the uh, request from Council Member Bonanno and, uh, and the uh, exceptions by uh, Council Member um, Carling. And so what I can do after this, I'll just, I can appoint a subcommittee of the two if uh, everybody else is, uh, Good with that. So, uh, Council Member, I see Council Member Monroe or Vice Mayor Monroe has got herself as a council member. Did you get, did you demote yourself or something? Apparently, I forgot to uh, switch that over. Anyway, uh, if, uh, so if, if you're also good with that, then I'll just right now yeah, sure. say that um, Council Member Carling and Bonanno are appointed to a subcommittee to work with staff as appropriate, maybe the right word is as cost-effective uh, as we go through this, uh, you know, to work a lot of details here. And uh, I'll just ask at this point, uh, city manager, are you okay with that? Honorable mayor, Mark Roberts, your city manager. Yes, uh, your uh, staff can uh, develop some policies and we can have uh, some check-ins, um, uh, several check-ins during the the finalization of all of the policies, timelines, um, and budget information as we've been discussing. But yes, um, we can certainly meet with the two members that have been identified. And, and I think uh, given their expertise, having both of them work, one at each of the uh, national labs we've got here, their uh, technical background, I think it would be very helpful 
for them to help the rest of the council and the community understand a lot of this uh, complex information. So, okay, now on to, uh, let's see who's next, uh, Vice Mayor Monroe. I fixed it. Um, so I, I just want to uh, add my thanks um, to the words of my colleagues. You know, to begin with that, this is really comprehensive. It was um, exciting to read and a little overwhelming. Um, the whole subject of climate change um, is a little overwhelming. This quantified it in ways that I thought were really helpful. Um, and I appreciate the idea that uh, council members Bonanno and Carling will be working on developing a, a, a way to explain it to the community and an and action plan going forward. I think that's a really uh, fine thing to do. Um, a couple of things that struck me, um, going back to the where this where we get the reductions from, um, the idea that it's from transportation and energy. Both of those are things that we take for granted, and I think that there's a real generational divide in the way we think about that. And it was exemplified by the comments this 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 evening. Um, I'm concerned not with what is being proposed, but how we change people's hearts and minds. We cannot, as a council, as a city, make anyone do anything. I mean, we can't. We can say we're going to do it, but if people choose not to do it, um, you know, we're in trouble. So what I'm wondering most about here I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the ideas and they're wonderful ideas. I was particularly struck by a number of the ideas from the transportation sector um, redu in reductions in cars. At the same time I see those going on, I know that we're also talking about how we make sure we account for parking downtown. Those two things are in a certain amount of conflict if we think about the two cultures going forward. So my real concern here and what I don't see addressed and maybe it's not time yet, is how do we do the, um, do the education piece? How do we talk about the, 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 to those who wanna listen, um, the idea that you know, we actually, we've seen temperatures, it's 115 degrees in Portland right now. So that's one of my concerns. And one of the areas I haven't seen uh, in terms of groups, um, to, uh, to uh, work with are the schools and the youth. And I know that, again, talking about that generational divide, um, the youth are the ones who are gonna be living with this. So I'm wondering if we can work on transportation, energy, and so on with the schools and particularly with the young people who um, will be, you know, for, for, for whose future this is. So that's one piece. And the second piece is, um, Mr. Marling uh, said that, you know, fires burn. They don't necessarily have to burn here for us, to, our, our air to suffer. So um, another area of connection that I'm, I'm wondering if we can focus on in terms of, the, I think that building, I wasn't um, uh, collaborating with, with different groups, is working with the county um, and working with our, our, our cities outside of, of, of this area. Um, as well, I think that's really critical to make happen as well. Um, so those would be be my comments on, on where we are. Um, and you know, this is just to. I know it's more. <laughs> this is already a long list, but um, those are the things that um, seem seem like they're necessary to make the actual work product go forward. Okay, Councilmember Member Kick. Um, so I wanted to start by talking about waste. Um, that is an issue um, that came to my mind for the first time when I was you know, really starting to learn about this whole cities thing. Um, back when the city council approved a development that had a lot of um, fruit trees. And I was wondering, how are you gonna get rid of all that fruit tree waste? Um, and one of the first conversations I had with public works was, 
do we help people do their own composting on site? Because we know that the, the mass composting that happens is actually pretty cost intensive. And I'm sure um, Carling knows about this, um, but it's really easy to compost at your own home um, if you have the land and space to do that. Um, but a lot of people, especially in rentals, do not. Um, so something I would like to, to you know, ask questions about and learn a little, little bit more about and think about as we're moving forward with this plan is how do we encourage um, HOAs and especially places that are rentals where you don't really have control of your yard space um, to do on-site composting. Um, if there is a carrot approach where we can incentivize that um, as people are, you know, just using um, the leaf blowers to blow their leaves and then they're taking them and putting them where if there was an opportunity for especially in rental developments to do something on site, it would be much more cost effective um, and kind of be an in your face like, look, we are uh, we are a green development. So that's one thing. Um, I also had a question about urban gleaning, um, which is something that was really popular in San Luis Obispo, where I went to college, um, where if you have fruit trees, um, are you allowed to let people pick them? Uh, there have been, you know, a neighbor of mine has uh, a lemon tree and she's like, oh, I don't know, we never eat those lemons. So she was worried about my son picking lemons off her tree. What if, what if he gets sick and, you know, there's a whole thing. So what are, what are we doing to encourage people to, to use the food that we have um, in ways that are really easy, just allowing people to, to eat from our environment? Um, and then I, I also want to talk a little bit about encouraging alternative transportation. So I actually rode my bike to the meeting tonight. I've ridden my bike from my house to work multiple times, um, but not in the evening, not at traffic time. Um, and East was a little precarious for me. I went that way instead of going through the trails like I usually do. Um, and like Council Member Carling said, um, bike trails are, are great but it doesn't matter if nobody uses them. And the reality is um, no one is going to use a bike trail if it doesn't take you anywhere. So we have lots of segments of our roads that are, you know, a portion of East has a bike lane and that's great. Um, but then it's pretty terrifying once you get to the part where there's no bike lane. Um, and so if we're thinking about when we're, when we're doing active transportation, if we're making sure that we're prioritizing um, an alternate alternative transportation highway system or grid system where we're connecting major roadways and major points of the community, I think it would be a better use of funding than, you know, small projects here and there because people might actually use it that way. Um, I also wanted to um, talk a little bit about how, again, people aren't going to use it if they can't um, because they live three hours away and they're commuting. And so there was a very small portion of this that talked about supporting infill development. Um, but I really think that the supporting infill development and housing projects um, that are within the, the urban growth boundary and in denser in places like downtown actually supports climate action in a pretty significant way. So I was disappointed to see that that was a very tiny piece, um, but I think it's very connected to alternative transportation. You can't use alternative modes if you live hours and hours away from where you work. So encouraging that work live environment comes from, from dense building. Um, so I would like to see that, have a little bit more information about that. Um, uh, lastly, um, we know that um, money is a great incentive for people um, and we can't just pay people to take their bike to work necessarily, um, but we have, um, amazing new companies in Livermore focused on green energy. And so um, encouraging those conversations between our economic development team and the climate action team, um, because companies will end up making money in this green energy sector, which will bring good jobs, which will, you know, increase value to our community as a whole. And so not forgetting that there's an economic benefit, a long-term economic benefit to this as well of being a green energy hub um, in the East Bay. And I think we have all of the tools to do that. I think really taking that into account as we're looking forward um, would be important. Um, and then I think it would be fantastic if Councilmember Carling and um, Councilmember Bonanno 
could chat a little bit with the um, marketing team at East Bay Community Energy. They're already working on a project um, talking about restaurant electrification with some chefs and um, a, I think it's Bon Appetit is the magazine they're going with. I'm not quite sure. It's some, some foodie magazine um, online. And uh, I think that it does specifically for, for small businesses and specifically restaurants, it's a little bit scary, um, but there's already great resources out there. So um, rather than wasting your energy on um, figuring out how to do that education and communication, um, EBCEs are already doing some great work. And so I'd be happy to set up a connection with you and, and that staff because they're doing, they're doing very good things. So overall, thank you for all of this work. Um, and I'm excited to, I'm excited. I think Livermore can be the, the green energy hub um, of the East Bay. I think we have it in us. Okay, I'll try and be uh, relatively quick. I think there's a lot of information here that needs to be um, possibly, as uh, Councilmember Bonanno uh, suggested, uh, better organized in a way that it's easier to grasp. And so I'm in particular interested in a sort of an XY chart that says, what's the cost and benefit? And I know we don't have all of that information yet, but that's essential. And then how do we display that cost benefit versus the choice of what point in time we deploy a particular strategy? And what I would be concerned about is being too aggressive on these goals more than we're required to. I think Councilmember Bonanno explored that. When we could be in a situation where there could be a new technology such as hydrogen that's just around the corner, and yet we're so anxious to show something that we make a mistake. So I think a good evaluation of the cost and benefit versus the time these are deployed with a cognizant of what technologies and options are out there is gonna be essential. And that's why I'm happy to see the two council members on a subcommittee to try and distill all this information down to an easier way to make these trade-off decisions, which I think we're gonna do. And I'd like to uh, emphasize uh, what council member Carling said and was in the public comment, the definition of cost-effective it's got to be clear. And in fact, if you if something is cost effective, then we should be looking at, you know, the there should be an incentive to do a change. There shouldn't have to be a stick. So I'm much more in favor of things being truly cost effective, truly making sure we're taking advantage of the best technology and options, and, and doing it in a very rational uh, effective way. So that's that's my comment. I, I would think at this point, uh, staff, you've got more than enough uh, comments from us. Do you need any more? No, I think this, no, is, I think this is great. Okay. So I think uh, you don't, so you've got your feedback. We're going to close out this item. We're past our normal time for uh, taking a break. Uh, let's take a break until 9.35. And we'll pick up six three.
Okay, ready for the uh, countdown. Did the uh, city clerk or TV30 hear that? Newton Mayor, TV30, are you available to do a countdown? Not sure, Mayor, I will send them a quick email. Uh, TV30, are you there? Sure, we cannot hear you for some reason. Uh, Can you hear me now? Trish, oh, never here. mind. Just kidding. Are we ready for the countdown? Yes, that's what we were asking for. Okay, sorry. That was... All right. Okay, here we go. In five, four, three, two... One, and we're live. Oh, welcome back, everyone. We're uh, going to uh, now get on to item uh, 6.3, resolution authorizing extension of the exclusive negotiating rights agreement with the uh, Shakespeare Associates. May I have the staff report, please? Honorable Mayor, this is Mark Roberts, the city manager, and I'm going to introduce Paul Spence, our community development director, who's going to lead us through this item. Good evening, this is uh, Paul Spence, your Community Development Director, and staff is recommending this evening that the Council authorize an extension of the Exclusive Negotiating Rights Agreement with Shakespeare Associates for the development of a Black Box Theater adjacent to Stockman's Park. Uh, excellent progress has been made in negotiations of a disposition and development agreement for the Black Box Theater, but there have been some delays uh, associated with COVID, and therefore uh, staff is requesting uh, that an extension be provided to allow for additional time to finalize the agreement. The existing negotiating rights agreement expires on June 30th and staff and the applicant are requesting this be extended to December 31st of this year to allow for additional time to finalize the agreement, the parcel map and related documents. And this uh, completes staff's presentation. We're available for questions. Okay, I'd like to open public comment on this. Is there anyone? Member of the public that wishes to speak? Mayor, no comments have been received. Okay, uh, close uh, public comment on it. Uh, bring it back to the council. Any questions, comments from the council? I don't see any. I've got one. Uh, do we have the right uh, time frame on this? Just given all COVID and everything else? To, are we confident that this will allow enough time to get this done? Yes, we think we're actually more like two to three months away. And, uh, but the, that longer time will, will give us a little bit of room on the backside in case we need it. Okay, then uh, I guess we need a motion on this. Anybody want to make it? I'll move, very excited. Okay, and uh, Vice Mayor Monroe seconds. Can we have a roll call please? Councilmember Bonanno? Aye. Councilmember Carley? Aye. Councilmember Kate? Aye. Vice Mayor Monroe? Aye. Mayor Warner? Aye. A motion uh, passes unanimously on to item 6 4. Uh, the uh, professional services agreement with PlaceWorks regarding the uh, general plan. Uh, we have the uh, staff report, please. Honorable Mayor, this is Mark Roberts, the city manager, and senior planner um, Andy Ross will lead us through this item. Good evening. Can everyone see my screen okay? Yes. Great. 
Uh, good evening, Mayor Warner and members of the City Council. So as uh, your city manager just mentioned, tonight item, tonight's item is focused on the consultant contract for the general plan and housing element update. Uh, and in addition, staff is seeking your authorization and direction to form an advisory committee for the general plan process. So I'll walk through uh, elements of the scope and uh, give a brief overview. So just as a reminder, the general plan is a comprehensive planning document. It establishes the city's vision for growth, uh, land use, sustainability, resource, and open space conservation. The general plan is required by state law and it broadly lays out the future of, uh, of the city's land use pattern through a series of policy statements, as well as a land use map. It also includes the foundation for transportation, conservation, and infrastructure planning. Uh, the current Livermore general plan was adopted in 2004. Uh, it's about 17 years old and is due for an update. And city council made updating the general plan a priority at its March goal setting meeting. Also in March, uh, council selected PlaceWorks as the consultant team to assist in the, in the general plan and housing element update. So state law requires a general plan to include uh, the following elements, the, those listed in the, on the left-hand column, uh, but cities can also combine elements or consider additional elements. So as shown on the right, this, uh, the Livermore general plan, for example, includes a community character element, a climate change element, an infrastructure and public services element and an economic development and fiscal element. However, all these elements are required to be consistent with each other. Uh, so the circulation element must be consistent with the land use element, the climate change element has to be consistent with the infrastructure element and so on. Uh, specifically, the housing element is required uh, to be updated every eight years uh, into, in order to incorporate new state requirements and growth projections. Uh, the current housing element uh, was adopted in 2015 and it's required to be updated by the end of 2022. So the contract scope of work is uh, broken into the following eight tasks, community engagement, visioning, research and analysis, land use alternatives, policy development and evaluation, the housing element, uh, overall document preparation, and uh, an environmental impact report. So at the onset, the project team will prepare an equity and inclusion plan that will include an overall community engagement strategy. This strategy will outline the types of outreach and engagement activities at key phases over the course of the project, uh, ensuring meaningful engagement with the whole community, including especially uh, community members that may have traditionally been underrepresented. Outreach and engagement channels uh, would include traditional workshop formats, pop-up events, online engagement tools, uh, virtual meetings, and possibly others. The first major community engagement activities will be around visioning. So this is where we will be looking out to the horizon year 2045 and developing a statement that articulates the community's shared values, aspirations, and goals. Visioning will include uh, community discussions as well as a comprehensive uh, survey. Ultimately, the final vision statement will be approved by the city council and will set the framework for policy discussions moving forward. So research and analysis will be a large component of the general plan and housing element update process. Early on in the process, uh, the project team will review existing planning documents and recent city efforts and conduct technical analyses to identify important background information. The team will prepare an existing conditions report which will establish a sort of baseline to work from and include an assessment of the city's current conditions, land use patterns, utility systems, public services, transportation and circulation networks. Uh, we will also conduct a market and real estate studies to identify underlying economic conditions that affect uh, Livermore and its role in the region, including key competitive attributes and elements that may influence economic growth. In addition, the project team will prepare a uh, real estate feasibility assessment to look at the types of development that are likely to develop under current or even possible future conditions. Finally, the, the project team will conduct a legislative audit to look for policy gaps, uh, re referring to uh, gaps in policy within the current general plan uh, that don't currently meet or address new state requirements. So based on the results of the visioning process, community feedback and council direction, the project team will develop 
um, and evaluate land use alternatives for specific geographic focus areas to explore potential changes to the general plan land use map over time. Uh, at the current time, the project team uh, anticipate that some of the city's existing general land use designations will only see modest changes, such as new policy guidance for residential neighborhoods that may now diversify unit types based on state law. Focus areas, on the other hand, will be geographic areas where more substantial modification to existing standards or new mix of land use types may be appropriate. Project team will conduct three land use alternatives for each of those focus areas that explore different possible types, locations, and intensities of development consistent with the vision statement, uh, as well as adopted or ongoing city efforts such as the active transportation plan and the climate action plan. Each alternative will include a performance evaluation where we would investigate uh, things like climate and resiliency, public safety and services, equity, housing and population, transportation, uh, and provision of open space. Based on the outcomes of at a community engagement process, the project team will ultimately create per a preferred scenario uh, that reflects input from the community planning commission and direction of the council. Uh, and then the team will conduct additional analyses regarding infrastructure improvements needed to implement that preferred scenario. And ultimately, these preferred scenarios will become the foundation for the updated general plan land use map and the quantitative analysis uh, needed in the general plan environmental impact report. So policy development and evaluation, the project team will evaluate existing general plan policies and recommend new policies in order to achieve the 2045 vision, as well as reflect council's goals and priorities. In addition to the legislative audit, which I just mentioned, the team will create a consolidated matrix of existing general plan goals and policies and evaluate whether these policies remain relevant, have been accomplished, should be located in other more appropriate planning documents, or should be modified. Uh, in addition, the project team will also recommend new and modified policies that reflect the city's uh, visioning efforts uh, going forward, improving clarity, address policy gaps or redundancies, and then also again to comply with new state law, state law requirements. So as part of public outreach and engagement, uh, the project team will facilitate discussions with the community about these new and expanded policy topics that, and they, these topics could include things like arts and culture, mobility choices and vehicle miles traveled, climate change, equity, and community health, just to name a few. Prior to a comprehensive draft general plan, the project team will prepare a complete set of draft goals, objectives, policies, and actions for review and feedback from the planning commission and direction from the city council. Moving on to the housing element, concurrently with the general plan update process, the project team will update the housing element. So the city's current housing element uh, needs to be updated by end of 2022 to comply with state law. The city's current regional housing needs assessment, or RENA, requires the city to plan for 4,570 new housing units over an eight year cycle. The housing element will include review of existing housing related documents, including annual progress reports and new housing legislation in order to evaluate the effectiveness and status of existing Livermore policies and programs. And currently the project team will prepare a needs analysis, identify housing resources and opportunities, conduct a housing constraints assessment, update goals, policies, and programs, and formulate a housing implementation strategy. In addition, the team will also identify viable sites for future housing units based on uh, an, an inventory analysis, looking at underutilized sites, uh, feasible infill site investigation, and also conducting infrastructure analysis. The team will also conduct a fair housing assessment consistent with state law to ensure that low-income housing sites are located in high resource areas rather than being concentrated in areas uh, or segregated um, into areas with lower resource um, access. The, unit will uh, the update will include the development of a monitoring tracking tool uh, in order to track housing and development over time. This tool will be an inventory and in our geographic information system uh, with an attribute table that contains relevant information to improve tracking and future no net loss analyses. Uh, this will both achieve the city's housing goals, but also help us comply 
with the state's annual progress report requirements. The project team will present the draft housing element to the Planning Commission and City Council prior to submission to the state for certification. In the later half of the project schedule, the project team will begin combining the various components uh, and work products of the project into a comprehensive general plan document. Initially, the project team will prepare a general plan outline, including you know, document format, page layout, and graphic display. Currently, the project team anticipates that the updated general plan will largely follow the same overall outline as the existing general plan. Important issues such as equity, environmental justice, community health, and climate change are interrelated with other topics. And so it may be more effective to integrate relevant policies pertaining to each theme into existing elements throughout the document, ensuring that these key issue areas will be incorporated into every area of work and development within the city. However, the general plan project scope provides for the flexibility to include some of these issue areas as independent elements if that approach is found to be more appropriate based on community feedback. The project team will prepare a general plan that meets state legal requirements, is internally consistent, includes city goals, objectives, policies, and implementation measures, and that responds to the city and community's needs. Project team will prepare and present the draft general plan for review by the Planning Commission and direction and final adoption by the City Council. And following the adoption of the general plan, the project team will continue on and will prepare and implement an online version of the general plan, which will make it more accessible to the broader community. The general plan update is considered a project under the California Environmental Quality Act or CEQA. And due to the size and scope of the update, the project team will prepare a programmatic environmental impact report, evaluating the development and conservation activities into the 2045 horizon year. The IR will include a project description, setting section, and identify any potential impacts, mitigations, or avoidance measures, and evaluate feasible project alternatives in accordance with CEQA requirements. So at this point, uh, the, project, the project team is recommending uh, that work products created as part of the general plan update be prepared with input from a general plan advisory committee. Uh, the staff's recommending a committee appointed by the city council comprised of approximately 15 community members representing Livermore's uh, broad diversity. The committee would review and provide feedback on work products uh, and serve as liaisons to the broader community and their uh, respective networks, and also advise the project team on effective outreach and engagement. The committee would uh, not be a decision-making body, they would be advisory, and the council uh, should, as the city council should remain responsible for final direction regarding the general plan content and adoption. Um, staff uh, recommends that the committee would be one of the many ways that, to obtain community feedback and perspectives throughout the planning process. The committee would provide an opportunity for members of the community to learn more about the general plan and city processes, but also for staff to gain consistent input on a variety of project aspects at a granular level that goes a, a little step beyond traditional community engagement. Staff recommends that the committee meetings should be inclusive and public, follow standard noticing requirements, and invite comments from the larger community to have fruitful discussions about topics that could be addressed in the general plan update. Uh, if authorized by council, the project team anticipates facility, facilitating approximately 24 committee meetings over the course of the general plan update. That's approximately monthly and or at key milestones. In addition the, uh, to, the to the committee, the project team is planning for regular check-ins with city council and or planning commission separate from general plan and housing element adoption hearings. And this would ensure that uh, we are receiving continuous feedback from the council and direction throughout the update process. So staff recommends uh, council authorize the formation of a general plan advisory committee and also provide direction to staff regarding the committee's makeup, the application development and selection method. Currently, council has a standing subcommittee for advisory body appointments. Staff recommends using this committee, the subcommittee, unless council would like an alternate approach due to the scope of this project. Based on your direction, your staff will return uh, at a future meeting with draft committee rules procedure, uh, proposed recruitment materials, and a formalized selection process. 
So staff recommends city council adopt a resolution authorizing the execution of a professional services agreement with PlaceWorks uh, and also authorize the formation of a general plan advisory committee directing staff to prepare necessary materials for the recruitment and selection of members. That concludes staff's overview of the scope of work for the general plan and housing element update. Uh, city staff, as well as Joanna Jansen from PlaceWorks are both available for any questions and here to receive your direction. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Do we have any uh, members of the public that would like to comment on this item? No, Mayor, no public comment has been received. Okay, uh, opening and closing the uh, public comment on this comes back to the council. Uh, any comments, questions? Uh, Councilmember Kick and then Councilmember Bonanno and then Vice Mayor Monroe. Um, so I just wanted to clarify. Are, uh, I say you guys are slow on the button. I know I'm on a different computer today, so okay. my my routines my routines broken up. Um, so I had uh, just a clarifying question for staff. Um, did you say that the climate and the housing are updated every eight years? Is that the correct number, Andy? No, sorry, just the housing element is updated every eight years. Okay, and so climate is updated at, at, at our own whim? Correct. Okay. As um, deemed necessary. As deemed necessary. Okay, cool. Um, that was my question. And then our current advisory body committee is uh, Vice Mayor Monroe and I, correct? And that would be staff's recommendation. Um, I, although I think that's fantastic um, that I would be given such uh, an important job to, to pick these people, um, given that it's uh, probably the, the biggest document um, that we'll be producing in a long time, um, I would suggest that we potentially involve um, other council members as well. If, if other council members would like to um, participate, there will be um, no pushback from me being on that advisory body. So I just wanted to put that out there for other council members to consider. Okay, um, council member Bonanno. Yeah, so a question I have is regarding the program EIR, what exactly is being assessed? I didn't quite understand the scope of the, the EIR for this project. Is, is it the, I wanna, I'll just let you answer that, Andy. Sure, so I would look out at um, the policies and programs proposed under the general plan out to tw year 2045. So it would take our existing conditions and then if we implemented those policies and programs, what would the impacts uh, and effects of that be? And would there need to be any mitigations or avoidance? So similar to your Isabel specific plan, which you reviewed recently, we looked at what would happen if out to this horizon year. I got it. Okay. So it's a program EIR, which is different than a project EIR. And it looks at what's been, what, what's being projected and proposed in this general plan and, um, as you say, forecast sort of what potential environmental impacts would be. Incorrect. Correct. Yep. Okay. And, and because it's an EIR, I would also then look at some feasible alternatives. Got it. Okay. Um, the, let's see, regarding uh, council member Kick's comment, um, you know, I, I, I guess I would, I would favor the full council being involved at some level. I mean, I don't know what kind of a hybrid configuration we could have. Uh, whereby we all get a little bit more of a say. I do think it's pretty important. And I think um, I, I don't have a solution for how to do that. Um, but, and I, I don't wanna make it a overly onerous task to pick the committee before we even get started on, you know, the scope of the general plan update itself. But, but I would like to have some role and I would be open to any suggestions that would uh, give us that opportunity. One more quick question. When what what's the time frame to have the committee in place and and seated so that they're ready to start their work well ideally it will be as soon as possible but this is forming committees is generally a three-step process 
We'll get your authorization and direction this evening. We'll come back to you at a future meeting uh, with rules procedure and selection. And then at, at some point after the interview process, uh, those members would be appointed. So we're probably looking around September-ish. Okay, a couple months. And I, I guess my first, my first uh, sense about the number is that 15 seems a little small to me. Um, I know there are pluses and minuses for having larger committees, but, but I think given the, the scope of this and just a rough list I put together of kind of stakeholder, stakeholders that I think would be important to include and to get full representation across the community, I've got a list of like 17 just off the top of my head. So I don't know what others feel about that, but 15 seems a little small to me. And that's it. Vice Mayor Monroe. Um, so uh, I, I had a quick question, just so I was a little puzzled. Um, my rec recollection of the general plan elements is that we had actually included uh, equity and inclusion as one of those elements. And I know it showed up all over in, uh, in assessing the community and um, developing the, the, the uh, work, the, the um, committee, the advisory committee. Um, and in perhaps being integrated into everything or perhaps standing alone. But I'm just wondering, am I misremembering that or did it somehow fall off because it was integrated in other ways? Um, Currently your, your 2004 general plan does not have an equity element. Right, but my recollection is, is that when we talked about this, we had talked about uh, adding that to it, particularly since we didn't choose it as a, a priority for um, yeah, one of our priorities for this. Uh, yeah. So one of the council's direction was that equity inclusion should be woven into the fabric of everything we do. And so okay. the approach the scope currently takes is integrating that into all the elements, but it right. allows for some flexibility uh, based on community feedback throughout the process if it merits its own standalone element. So we'll probably know as we get through a few of these milestones of where we, where we are with that. So the difference would be, I mean, I guess my only concern is that if it's not specifically called out as an element, it's easy to not have it there as a, as a reminder. On the other hand, I see the point that if it's there as its own standalone, um, it might not get integrated. Um, if there's some way to manage that, that would be great. Um, uh, so that, that would be, that, that was the one question I had there. In terms of choosing the uh, advisory body, um, I tend to agree with uh, both my colleagues that um, it's, this is something that's gonna shape the city for the next 20 years and having two of us choose the advisory body uh, doesn't feel quite right. Um, that said, um, I also understand, you know, I. <laughs> choosing 15 to 18 people. And I would, I'd say that we could go up to as many as 18. I would, I would go along with that. Um, or maybe even 20, but yeah, probably 18 sounds about the top, the top number for me. Um, I think you want to know. Like a, a point taken. Yeah. All right. So 19, how's that? <laughs> <laughs> Under 20 is what I'm trying to do here. Um, I, I, it, it seems to me that uh, I, I'd like some process whereby we can choose them without, as a uh, council member Banana said, being too onerous. Um, so then that's, that's all I got to say. Yeah, uh, before I come back to uh, Councilor, okay, look, there, there's one way to do this. Uh, if you think about it, there's a, you know, more the merrier, but the more painful. And we, we saw that on the, uh, downtown steering committee. So going, there isn't such a thing as too large. So I don't know what the number is. That certainly you start going past 15, you're, it's more difficult, but it's whatever, you know, the council wants to go. The other thing is you're talking about say 15 to 19 people you're trying to select. I think this is a, uh, a lot of people, it's, it's very important. And I think that we could easily have a lot of applicants. And we have also, I think from the Brown Act, we either do all five at once or we do two. 
So my suggestion is that let's see how large the pool of applicants is, but then we divide that pool into two and two council members take half and the other two take the other half for, for um, getting say, whatever half the number of applicants and then, or, you know, winnow it down and then we can do it as a, as a whole. But there's, this is a tremendous amount of work. Uh, there's no reason why half the applicants can't be screened by two council members and the other half by another two in my mind. So a council member kick. Um. Yeah, I was going to ask Joanna, what is your suggested number? I remember during the application process, you talked about a, a good number. What was that number you had? Um, sure, we did talk uh, a little bit about that. And um, the scope says approximately 15. I, I do think that's a good size uh, hearing, you know, that some council members have ideas about a slightly higher number, even as much as 19. I do. Um, I, I agree that that's workable. I'll just comment again that I think once you start getting over that number, over about 20, which I've heard people say, you know, they're not advocating for, it does, what we see is, is both that um, folks don't necessarily feel that they have time to speak during the meetings because there's so many people who need to speak and also that there's some attrition maybe related to that because the group seems so large that individual members might question, you know, that they're, whether or not they're essential to it or whether or not they can have a meaningful role in it. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to make, I mean, I'm sure that you talked with staff, but I just wanted to check and, and make sure since you'll be the one dealing with this group the most. Um, so I was thinking about how, you know, we just interviewed everybody for our council and that was a bit much, I think. Um, I, in talking to staff, I got numbers that if we're going to have a group of potentially up to 20, that we might expect a hundred applications and that's kind of a lot to go through. Um, and so my uh, suggestion that I had and thought about was that maybe, um, you know, if we have a committee um, that we're only interviewing, um, you know, if we're going to get to 15, we're only interview 20. And um, maybe each of us council members sort through and say, here's the five I think we should definitely interview. And staff can be the one saying, oh, they've already been chosen on so-and-so's list. Um, just so we can all feel like we have a role to play and maybe we, we get those interviews down um, to a more reasonable number, like 20 rather than 100, if that is what it looks like. Um, and then I would just, uh, to staff, some direction that I think um, I would like to see is that when we're doing this, um, you know, in conversations with Mark, we had um, a group of people, um, none of which were renters, um, all of which were white, um, and how do we have a diverse group without collecting that data? Um, and I, I wanna be very strategic in how we think about what that data collection looks like so that people aren't assuming that you're only being chosen because of one factor of your identity. Um, I just, I think it's important that we ask those questions though, and specifically do that same type of demographic data that we would usually do like in a census count um, just so we can have a really accurate um, idea of who we're talking to. Um, and I think the number one most important question in my mind will be um, how active and engaged are you with your neighbors and your community? So um, what groups do you engage with on a regular basis that you can bring this information back to? How active are you on, on various social media platforms? And when I think about that social media piece, that also makes me a little bit nervous because the last general plan was in 2004. Um, MySpace launched that year and so did Facebook. And so those were our first ever social media things were just coming out. So that was not an issue. So whatever we, whoever we do choose, I think it's important to ask about their media usage and come up with some guidelines about how they communicate about this process online because they will have our name as, as a city associated with everything that they do and say. Um, and so making sure that we're very intentional about how we have that conversation and asking them how they plan to use media or setting some guidelines as in either you can talk about it this way or you don't talk about it at all, um, just so we all know what's going on. So um, I know Joanna's probably done um, more work um, since 2004. So she's probably dealt with this, but just being very intentional about that, I think would be important. 
Okay, uh, let, before we keep going, I think we need to um, focus and, on, and, and take care of one item at a time, if we may. So the first, there are a couple of questions here. Uh, one is, what's the size of the group? So we have to do that. And the second question is, how do we want to go from say 100 applications to that size? Then you just raised, what are the questions and how do we uh, generate them? For instance, if, okay, and then how do those questions become consistently applied uh, across all of the uh, interviews that we might be going through? So I've got, we've got those questions. I think we've got to march through them. Otherwise, we'll be here a long time. Uh, do you, uh, Councilor Bonanno, do you have another key question that we want to address or uh, how do you want to build on what I just said? Uh, it's very quick comment. First, I, I agree with what Council Member Kick said um, all the way, all the points she made I thought were very important. And the, I think the application, the questions, how, what we ask people, especially if we're going to get a large group, that, you know, that's going to be a substantial part of what we use in addition to some face-to-face -face interview as well. But I think the application is really important. I don't know if we're going to have any input to the application questions itself. Uh, sure. If we could do this, if we could really take a topic at a time, yeah. Because uh, the application, as we've agreed, is is one of the topics. Can we at least get the list of topics, and then we can come back to each? But if each of us keeps going around on all of the topics, we're never going to get done. I so we we've got we've got the size of the. Let me just enumerate it here. We got the size of the group. We've got um, how to interview. What are the questions? Uh, and what was, and let's see, I'm, I'm losing it here. What else? Is there another topic that I missed? Did you have the application questions on the I application? said the size of the group, how to interview, and what are the questions? Yeah, it covers it, I think. Is there another topic that anyone would like to suggest that we need to solve tonight? Council member or vice mayor Monroe, you have your hand up. Do you want to say something? I was going to comment on the first topic. Okay. So, the, so we're, matter, so wait. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Okay. So we have those topics. Are we clear on the topics? Okay. All right. So let's now topic one is what's the size of the group? So that's, that's the focus of the conversation. So I'll start. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so I'll be brief. Um, 15, I think, sounds like the right number to me. The reason I was willing to push it higher than that is because um, I've been in situations where um, I want to have a little flexibility. And so that range between 15 and 19, and maybe 19 is too high, and the number that uh, Council Member Bonanno suggested, 17 is fine. But my goal there was simply to say, let's give a you know, you know, set a top number. Um, and give a little bit of a range. So. Okay, and if I'll just add to it, we have experts here who have done this in many, many places. So I would ask, what's the recommendation from staff with respect to this? Our recommendation is 15. 15. Do we on this council have any expertise that would suggest that we're better able to pick the number than staff? Well, I don't no. think it's a fair question. I'm sorry. I, I, don't I think know, I know, but I'm just, I'm just suggesting. Let, let, me, let me just finish. I, I think it has an obvious answer. The answer is no, we don't have more expertise. But we've been asked to comment on this. And I think, as May, Vice Mayor Monroe said, maybe put out a range. We'll see who we get. I mean, I think if you start thinking about our goals, which are, I think, substantially different than our goals last time, we, we want to be very complete. We want to include as many stakeholder groups as seem appropriate. So what about a range, 15 to 19? And, and we'll, we, we don't have to make a precise number tonight, I don't think, right? Uh, I, no, we don't have to do anything, but the, uh, I, I suggest we do pick a number so we can get moving on it. I would also suggest that something that's in here is we can have the concept of alternates because there would be attrition. So I would go for picking 15, frankly, with up to four alternates that'll be 
slot it in in case anybody drops, because this is a multi-year process. If that's a motion, I would second it. I'm not sure that's how we're doing this. Okay, I make that motion. Anybody want to second that? I did. Oh, I you just did. did. You did second it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Any any discussion on that motion? That's fifteen core and four alternates. Okay. I don't to go along with the majority, but I, I think we'll find it when we when we start looking at the the the, the swath of people we want to include in this community. We're going to see fifteen seems small, but I'll, I'm I'm not going to argue it any any further. I'll just well, what we have, we're, you know, we can always expand it later. Okay, that, that's fine. So let's kind of just vote on this one. Can we have a roll I, call I, on that. No, fine. Councilmember Bonanno. Aye. Councilmember Carling. Aye. Councilmember Cake. Aye. Vice Mayor Monroe. Aye. Mayor Warren. Aye. Okay. Now the next question is how to interview. And I'll suggest that is the next question because once we understand um, who the interview, pro what the interview process is, we can, uh, we can appoint a couple of people to work with staff on the questions is the way I would do it. So uh, we got, we had a, uh, a suggestion on, uh, how to interview it, let me make sure if I can repeat this council member kick and then you can tell me if I got it. But I think what you said is we ask for all of the applicants and then each of us, we're five of us, we each pick four or five to say, this is the set. And if there's any redundancy, we kind of keep going through it until we get that 20 or 25 well, I guess we're going to choose 19, then we're going to have to have a little bit more number. But I, your concept was we have the applicant pool. We each get individually a, uh, a set that we want to interview. And then that's the set that is interviewed. And that it could be then, uh, then the next question is, what's the process for interviewing them? Can you help me with what your thought is on how to complete yeah, the my process? My thought was that we we would each have probably our a top few, just like when we were, you know, doing doing council um, interviews for council member Bruno. And um, that we would just say, I don't know what the correct number is now that we're going to 19 with the alternates. Um, but I would maybe say, hey, Mark, here is my top five. Um, does my top five over overlap with anybody else? And if so, he would say, yes, pick a new top five. And then I would pick that new top five or whatever. So we weren't breaking any Brown Act violations by discussing this, who we were choosing with each other. Um, and then we would interview. And then hopefully with the kinds of questions we were asked, we would get some feedback from staff. They might say, hey, I noticed, you know, in your top five and mixed with everybody else's, we have no renters and that's a problem. So can you think about that a little bit more? Were there any renters that you think were really important? Just kind of making sure that we have some some basic diversity. If we all picked 50-year-old um, white men, then we might um, not be really representative. So um, that staff would be the one kind of giving us some suggestion on how to diversify our pool um, if necessary, rather than having us continue, continuously have to have workshops about this. So I anyway, think uh, you just mentioned another topic here, uh, which is what's our diversity criteria? I, I was very um, anxious about creating said criteria because I don't think we as the council should define what that is. Um, but I think it's it would be a pretty obvious one if 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 we all had the same top five people. Um, I don't think the diversity of us will get us the same top five people. Um, something that um, City Manager Mark Roberts let me know before. Um, some basic things when we're talking about land use policy, um, you know, maybe having some basics about people that live in different parts of the community. So mapping out where people live, um, a variety of home ownership so here's the, levels. So here's, yeah. here, here, excuse me if I can. What I'm, sure. I'm trying to not work it in this conversation, but what we really have to do is figure out how to align on the kinds of things you were just saying. 
Right. So even if you say we each get a pick of X number out of the pool, and then we've got somebody out there seeing if our pick is diverse enough or whatever, we still have to come up with the criteria. I think you just added another topic we have to figure out is the method for aligning on that criteria so that we know when we're done, right? So we it's, I'm talking about the method for getting to the answer rather than debating the answer now, because we'll, we'll, we'll go a long time. So that's... Mayor Warner? Yes. Uh, this is your city attorney, Jason Alcala. Um, I just want to interject here as far as the selection. Um, uh, council member uh, Kick, one thing that you had described was each council member making a selection and providing their choices to the city manager or to somebody else at the staff level to see whether there is overlap. Um, that can be done. However, it would have to occur at a noticed meeting. Um, mm -hmm. If that occurred outside of a noticed meeting, that would be considered a what's called a secret ballot and would not be consistent with the Brown Act. So I just wanna maintain expectations as far as using that particular aspect um, to, to your selection. Yeah, that's what I was kind of hoping you'd weigh in here. Uh, is it, so what, you know, we've kind of got into the size range that we want. So we, we got the, you know, the 19 people and then we can bring them in to full whatever, or, or however. So we've met what Councilmember Bonanno and Vice Mayor Monroe have said. In principle, we were there. So we got a we got a pool. Then we can figure out how to utilize them. But I'm uh, I'm just thinking we're going to go, and we can, but we're going to spend a long time tonight trying to formulate something that makes sense here. That's just my impression. I have a suggestion. So, uh, Honorable Mayor and, and Vice Mayor, um, if I could, your city manager, Mark Roberts. Um, what we can do based on the conversation that we've had so far is to, um, you know, if the mayor wants to appoint himself as to uh, work with staff to bring back an option or two for council. Oh, no, no. I definitely don't want to appoint myself here. There we go. Well, then what we could do is, um, uh, <laughs> fair enough. Um, so, either with or without sort of a, a council member or two to help us uh, on the process here. Um, essentially what I'm hearing is a couple of things. We, we've aligned on the size. Um, we expect a large number of people to apply. Um, we'll ultimately need to come up with an application process, which you've hinted at would be a subcommittee of the council to work on those questions. And then we need to come up with a process to take from, you know, a hundred applicants down to some number to actually do a uh, in-person interview. And the process that was discussed was that each council member choose a certain number. So let us, as your staff, work on what that number would be because we, we sort of can't have the back and forth in that process, but we maybe would have you rank your top five or six or seven until we get to an agreed upon number um, that you would want to target to interview, probably a minimum of 25 maybe as many as 30, um, so that then you all would be able to look at all of the attributes that you're looking for, geographic diversity, age diversity, whatever those things are, uh, whether you're a renter or an owner, um, and you would have enough uh, room within those number of folks that you are going to collectively interview um, that you would be able to put together your 15 plus four, because I think otherwise you will get caught in an endless do. And we can bring back that uh, what I just said uh, with a little more uh, detail um, at the next time we, we come forward. And what I would maybe suggest at this point is to perhaps uh, appoint your subcommittee to work with staff on the questions to again, bring back um, to council. Because I think again, uh, doing these in open session uh, will work quite well. Um, we do want the questions to be uh, known beforehand on the application. So I don't think there's a question of trying to keep that um, you know, private. Um, but that would, I think, uh, I think we've got a little bit of uh, guidance here. And I think otherwise you're, you're right. You could take a while to, to create the process in open session. Yeah. So here's, if I can add to what you said for consideration here okay. is we could submit to the, whatever subcommittee we've got here going to do this, each of us, what are the, three to five questions we think are important. 
And we could also submit what do we think are the three to five diversity attributes that we want to make sure that, you know, or something like we could, we could give a little bit of starter input. Is that possible with under the Brown Act? Jason, you want to weigh in on that one? With regard to your guidance tonight, I think that's within the scope of your agenda item. Okay, so I would say to those of us that want to give input to the committee, uh, you know, we do that. So they've got some something to work with. So that when it comes back to us, we're getting, we're closer to where we want to be. Uh, then the other thing though, that I think what I heard was uh, we've got three people who are potentially interested in doing this uh, and we've got two slots. So we could make it the traditional uh, advisory body interviewing thing, or we could draw lots or, um, you know, the, the three of you could decide which of the two of you or however you want to do it. Unless I haven't seen uh, uh, Council Member Carling weigh in on this. So I assume he's not chewing, chomping at the bit to be on this thing. So how, right. how do you, how do you, why don't you guys, oh, here we go. I got him. Can, can I ask a, a, a clarifying question? Um, sure. What I, when I heard us, all three of us saying wasn't that the three of us were interested, but that we believed that it was either two or five, that it was the process. Um, that's different than the three of us being interested. So I, I, I don't think the question is, you know, oh, oh, do, okay, okay. yeah. Well, no, that's, yeah. A, that's a good point. And, uh, so I made it clear that it, I don't want to be on that. Okay. I don't feel I need to, I trust whatever the, happens. That uh, is the way I'm looking at it. I'm, I'm just, I think that's, what's it's that? Fine. Is that the interview question committee or the interview committee? The getting the, uh, the questions. Okay. And the, um, attributes that define that we know when we're, we're, we have a broad enough representation from the community. I'm good with that. So the, the question that we have is, and, and I think this is unusual enough that we need to think carefully as to who uh, is most wanting to be on the interview for this thing or however to figure it out. I have no preconceived notion one way or another. I'm just tossing it out there that I think there may be more interest uh, on this than in general. There is a desire to get us all involved, that the fact that we're gonna be picking a subset of each picking some group to interview kind of works for that. And the last question is who wants to be on the subcommittee to define the process, to refine it with staff? And at this point, uh, Council Member Carling, what do, you, what do you got? Well, I'm not sure I'm gonna add very much, right? The way this is the way I look at it. I mean, you could either have Councilmember uh, Kick and Vice Mayor Monroe interview everybody and make a suggestion, which I don't support, or you could have all five of us interview everybody, which I don't support. And so I think uh, City Manager's suggestion of uh, letting the staff work it, and bring it back to us with some uh, specific uh, options from which to choose, I think is reasonable. I will say, and I don't need an answer tonight, but I will say that one of the things that I don't understand yet and I worry about is if I was to pick five, and I don't know, five out of a group of, I don't know, all of them, I don't know the answer to that. I don't need an answer tonight. I'm just saying five out of how many, I worry that we would err on, oh, I know that person. I know this person. I mean, we each know a lot of people in this community. And how do we ensure that we pick people that do represent a cross section that aren't you know, friends of Bob, for example? And which um, Bob? I, somehow, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> um, but somehow, and I think city manager knows that, um, but again, that's something that's sort of on my mind and thinking about it. I would be happy. I mean, I would support council member Kick and vice mayor Monroe working with staff on this. I mean, they've already, 
uh, interviewing for advisory bodies, that'd be fine with me. So I think, uh, you know, what you just said is what I was concerned about, because just picking a few is a little weird, possibly. That's why I'm saying if we've had two uh, groups of you got, you know, we had two, two sets of two council members going through half of the broader population, you have the ability to do what you were saying, Council Member Carling, in terms of getting a broader perception and you're at least working with somebody else on it. But, so I don't know what the answer is, uh, but that's, I, I think what you, you kind of hit where, what I was bothering me is that if we just have a few out of a hundred, it's a little strange too, but I, I think, think we're- Half is, is maybe one of the suggestions that the city manager and the staff bring back to us, and we could talk about that. So. Yeah, and I, the only, and I, and I think that's where we do have to rely on some help here to get us to the end. I'm just wondering, I'm just tossing it out there. Do we, do we want to change up in any way the two of us that can work with staff and the city manager to come up with the recommendation that'll come back to us at the next meeting. We have our standing subcommittee, that's, that's okay. Is there a need to change that? Does anybody want to change that? Because we could. I, I see Vice Mayor Monroe, you've got. I do, I, yeah. So first of all, I would be very interested in working on both determining the attributes or the stakeholder status or whatever we want to call it of the people. Uh, I do think it's possible by doing that to limit the uh, friends of, well, friends of Trish, friends of, you know, what, whoever uh, factor, because you actually have a structure that you're, you're putting together. And I, I do think that that's part of it. Um, in terms of, of each of us, I, I think that it would be a good thing, and I maybe misunderstood um, uh, what factors we have, but it, it seems to me that if we're looking for 19 people that we choose our top 19 and submit those and see, you know, from that we get a list of say, I don't know, 25 or something that, that we then interview. I'm not in favor of having two and two just because uh, if you're choosing one committee, I think you need some consistency. So at the point that we have, um, uh, you know, we've narrowed it down some, which I think we could do in, in that process of, you know, I'm picking not my five, because that's, I just, that's just, for choosing 19, I want to choose 19. There's going to be overlap, and I, th I think that'll help. Um, then at, at that point, we can, we can, take a recommendation from staff on, on where we go forward. And finally, I think that the questions we can do the same way. Oh, actually not finally. Well, the last thing is, is that we've mentioned that uh, PlaceWorks has a certain amount of experience in this and maybe we should use it. Uh, so um, I would like them to weigh in, um, preferably you know, sooner rather than you know, now would be great. So, okay. Uh there are a couple of things that you, you raised, and so it depends on what weighing in, but here's, here's something that we've also got. We have left how to interview, you know, what are the questions and how do we know we have a, a broad enough uh, representation from the community? And what occurred to me as you, as you were talking there, we don't have to have the same two council members answer each of those three questions because they are separable. So we have another choice here is we could put two on how to get broad enough representation, put a, the same two or a different mix on what are the questions. I'm just, I'm just trying to give the council members here as much opportunity to participate in this process. So yeah. uh, I we like don't that have to idea. Have, we don't have to have all the two answer all three questions because they are, you know, as I said, they're orthogonal or separable. That council member Carling. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. I'd be, I mean, I'm glad to help in any way. And if, uh, if you want to you know, pair me with somebody for some of the other parts of it, I'd be happy to do that. And I don't, I don't have uh, a preference. 
other than helping in any way I can. So yeah, yeah I, I'd, I'd be glad to do that. Yeah, I think this is important and to have all of you guys engage on it uh, and two at a time on the different topics kind of works. So, uh, okay. So does that make sense I mean, with the, my head nodding that we kind of, we don't have to have the same two on all the questions. Okay. Can I, can I make a couple of suggestions following up on that? Sure. Um, I would suggest that given that uh, Council Member Bonanno has sort of come up with her list and I've been sort of thinking the same question that the two of us work on the attributes and that Council Member Carling and Council Member Kick work on the questions. I'm good with that. I'm fine with that also. Um, hold on, let me raise my hand. I think we're done. Well, I have I have one because we're in a group. I'm not on the group that's doing the attributes. I would just caution Vice Mayor Monroe and Councilmember Bonanno to be very, very careful about defining what diversity means in the community, but maybe think about what kind of demographic questions we're asking instead. Um, because if we're we're defining the community without knowing the community. So let them define themselves. Um, would It just worries me. Someone's going to be very yeah. angry that we left them out. So I, uh, I no, got no, it. I understand. If I could just say this, now you're presuming that we don't have a broad enough representation and that we have to up the numbers. So we're going back into that world. Um, so if we just said we were agreeing as to who was on what. So let's trust everyone that the assignments we just gave to do the job. And then they're gonna come back to all five of us and we'll, we'll have a check step there. Does that make sense, guys? Yes, can I, can I add a small? Sure. Can we work with, um, I assume that Vice Mayor Monroe and I can can ask either someone from PlaceWorks or someone from staff to help us. Absolutely, that. that's the that's the whole idea. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, if I don't, I, I think I wanted to clarify that, that that we would be looking for someone else, an objective third party, to help us uh, work through that. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks, guys. I'm sorry, I was a little sippy earlier. I apologize, especially. Uh, Councilmember Bonanno and Vice Mayor Monroe. I uh, want to, so I apologize. And the, um, I think we're there. So, uh, so in, in, um, oh, sorry, Mark, go ahead. And I think uh, Senior Planner Ross is going to say exactly what I said. We have uh, complete um, guidance on the second of the two items that we need, which is a direction on how to move forward on the formation of the advisory committee. Um, we still need a council motion and direction on oh, yeah. the I first was, item. I was, was going to go there. Oh, good. Well, then we're all on the same page. We do have enough guidance on the second one, though. Thank you. All right. So I, I just want to, you know, just stay on the one topic and we're kind of like good, right? Okay. So now we need to come back to the first one and get a motion on that. Unless we want to talk more about it. I'll move staff recommendation. I'll second. Yeah. Okay, good. Can we have a, any any discussion on the motion? Okay, I will roll call, please. Councilmember Bonanno. Aye. Councilmember Carling. Councilmember Carling. Councilmember Colling, I think I saw your lips move, but couldn't hear you. Aye. Thank you. Councilmember Cake? Aye. Vice Mayor Monroe? Aye. Mayor Warner? Aye. Okay. That item is uh, done. Unanimous. Now we're on to uh, Council Committee Reports and Matters Initiated. And I can't remember. Oh, is it uh, Councilmember Cake? Oh. I see Can, Vice Mayor Monroe, what, uh, I, I what, just, what do you yeah, want to? I, I just wanted to, maybe somebody could remind um, our 
attendees that uh, public comment is at the beginning. I see a hand up. Oh, okay. I thought we went through uh, public comment, open and closing on that. Did I just screw up? No, I just wanted to clarify, make sure that it was clarified. You, you did it. You okay. All right. On to uh, item seven, for which there is no public comment. It's council uh, committee reports and matters initiated. Uh, council member Kick. Yes. Um, so I got to do the mayor's report, which was very exciting. Um, and during that, I got to talk about um, lots of things, um, but specifically Pride Month today is the 52nd anniversary of Stonewall. So I wanted to mention that. That's why I have my super cool scarf on. Um, and I talked about um, our All-American Cities Awards and all good things. You can watch it online. Um, I also was uh, lucky to attend with um, Council Member Bonanno and Council Member Carling um, a Juneteenth celebration um, and um, get to connect with um, various community members who came out to that and they were um, excited to hear about the proclamation, the group that was there. Um, and then yesterday I got to attend um, a Native American drawing celebration, um, which was also very cool. And then I had my regular meetings that I went to, but those were the fun things that I wanted to um, share. Everything else is in the document. And I have no matters for today. I will save them for another day. Good. Okay. Um, Councilmember Carlin. I don't have anything to add that uh, I haven't put in the report. Thank you. Okay, Councilor Bonanno. Yeah, I'll just just mention one of the things that um, you can find everything else in the report. We uh, had a meeting with the new laboratory director and her senior staff, our first uh, female laboratory director. And um, I think she she's doing a very good job from everything I hear, including my son who works at the lab now. Um, so that was very, very cool meeting. We had um, Mayor Warner, of course, and senior management uh, leadership from the city was there. I was there to help um, uh, report out on some of the collaboration opportunities we're working on with Livermore Lab with Roger Ains, who's the energy chief scientist at Livermore. So that was, I thought, a very interesting and uh, hopefully productive meeting. A lot of discussion about where the lab and the city might uh, increase their strategic partnerships. So uh, keep people posted on that. And I think that's all I really had tonight. Good. And uh, Vice Mayor Monroe. Well, uh, in my report, as with Council Member Carlings, we, we both mentioned that the last equity and inclusion uh, working group meeting took place. It was a full meeting. It was a wrap up um, and, uh, and led to um, evaluating a number of options, which will be presented uh, July 26th. Um, so I just, I, it's been quite a long process and I thought it was worth calling out just that, what, what a journey. Um, and I'm really excited to, uh, to get all of your, your uh, feedback on July 26th. Um, I, I, most of the information I have is, is uh, the other meeting I, I attended was ABAG. That's, uh, there's a link to that on my report. Um, I stopped in at the uh, Livermore American Indian Center, um, which was very cool. Um, and I had one more item that we just received information about from um, our human uh, housing and human services division. Um, it looks like we are starting to have people moving into Goodness Village, um, and the intent is to have them move in a little bit, a few at a time, so that they will be uh, that, that all the homes will be filled by the end of September. So this is very good news. Um, and I thought it was worth sharing. That's all I got. Okay, good. I, the only thing uh, I'll mention, I agree with uh, Councilman Bonanno that the meeting with the lab was, was really good. And I wanted to um, uh, point out that Councilman Bonanno, uh, I think you, you started 
the thought of the lab and the city uh, meeting, how, how many years ago was that? 2009, I think, at least a decade ago. Right. So anyway, that 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 one of the uh, people behind that that meeting was very good, and then uh, you know, as you all know, I I had an interesting experience with the uh, my first uh, state of the city. So I'm glad that's uh, that I'm on the other side of that one. Uh, so it was, good, but the city's in a good uh, a good spot. So with that. Um, we're going to adjourn to a regular city council meeting on July 12th, uh, 2021 at 7 p.m. Again, held virtually.